Hi, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. Today is a really fun one for me because we interviewed Mick Gordon. For those of you that don't know who Mick Gordon is, the link is below. Mick Gordon is arguably one of the most successful composers for video games, like ever. My son, who's nine, plays a lot of the games like the Marvel games and the Need for Speed, and I kept seeing Mick's name in the credits. And I did a little research and I found out that he was in Australia and I wrote to him and he wrote back. So I think this is one of my most exciting interviews for me. I did it when we were in Nashville a couple of weeks ago. So it's all done on uh, Skype. So there's a little me here and a big him. It's a long interview. We touch on lots of stuff, but he's really animated. He's really positive. He's a wonderful guy. He's very talented. And I feel like for so many people out there, they want to know how to get into this world. How do you get into making music as a composer for video games? Not only do you, how do you get into it, but how do you maintain a career? How do you build relationships? And Mick touched on all of this stuff. There's some technical stuff, there's some, there's some creative stuff, but I think most importantly, there's also that part of it, that way to engage, get ideas from people, cultivate ideas, understand them, get inside their heads and create something really magical. So check out the interview. It's really wonderful. It's one of my favorite ones I've ever done um, with Mick Gordon. Of course, as ever, please subscribe. Go to Produce Like a Pro, sign up for the email list. And if you like, try the 14 day free trial. So here we go. Mick Gordon. Enjoy. So hey, everybody, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm with the great Mick Gordon. I'm going to call you great and you're going to accept it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I first, so I was just talking about, I have a nine-year-old son and he's a little bit more cutting edge than I'll ever be, even at nine. So he knows more about video games than I'll ever know. And Mick's name appears a lot. You appear all over the place. You are <laughs> a man of many talents. Now you started off as a guitar player and now you've ended up being you know, arguably one of the most successful, probably one of the most successful guys on the planet doing music for video games. Well, I'm not, I'm not fishing for compliments, that's for sure. <laughs> no, but you, 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 you've been a, a common denominator in many, many discussions I've had with people. And you started becoming requested by lots of people. People would write to me and say, you need to talk to this guy. Oh, that's so, cool. So I've been hit that's from really many, cool. many different directions. And well, cool. you're a guitar player, so I love that. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, it's super cool, Warren. And thanks again. Thanks so much for having a chat. This is really, really cool. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I kind of started playing guitar when I was about 12 years old. Yep. And um, got into all the good stuff like everybody else, like Stevie Ray Vaughan and the Jimi Hendrixes and all that sort of stuff. I yes, still I, love that stuff. I see the uh, I see the strat behind you there. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. There's some stuff. Don't look too closely. Yeah, check this one out. This is a, uh, this is a, uh, a Tibetan Kangling, right? And uh, this is my, my instrument wall. There's all sorts of cool, kind of unique stuff sitting yeah. up here. So this is a Tibetan Kangling, which I got for a, uh, for a fighting game project. And um, I'll let you guys Google it, what it actually is, but it's kind I of creepy. Yeah, you can <laughs> kind of have a look at that one. Um, I'm not going to play it for you because it, it really doesn't sound that great. But yeah, but anyway, there's all sorts of stuff back there. There's pedals and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, so I got, got into guitar you know, stuff when I was a teenager and played in bands and things like that. I really just got stuck into it. I really loved it. Yeah. Um, it's that nice feeling when you find that thing that you really feel like you were meant to do, right? So uh, it just kind of comes more naturally that way. Um, and you, you, you think about it all the time. You know, when you're trying to go to sleep at night, you're thinking about music. When you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about music, right? Oh, yeah. So that, that, that was my kind of teenager experience, which was really cool. And then when I got kind of a little bit older and I left school, I started looking at different ways to, you know, obviously have a career and I wasn't really good at anything else. I didn't do very well with math and science and things in school or any of that sort of stuff. So um, music really felt like the thing that I kind of wanted to do with my, my career. Now, when I was looking at different sort of options with that, um, I didn't really feel at that time confident enough in my own abilities to, you know, go into writing music for, uh, you know, the pop world or the rock world or forming bands or even film music or that sort of thing. But um, I'd always, you know, played video games and video games were kind of an interesting thing for me. So um, 
you know, I looked at some different options and stuff. And here in Australia, where I'm based, at that time, there was about 40 different companies here in Australia making video games. And there was literally very few people, pretty much nobody doing music and sound. So to me, that was kind of a really lucky, fortunate situation to be in. How um, long ago was that? Uh, so that was about 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. So it was a little while ago. And um, yeah, so I just kind of went from there. I started making music on a computer and things like that and sending it out to different companies and started getting some lucky callbacks and stuff and started auditioning on some projects and things and kind of just went from there. That's pretty amazing. Now, your writing process, are you still writing on guitar and then expanding into using programs? What's your, how, do, how do you write or do you, is there no rules? Sometimes you start with a beat. I mean, what's your sort of process? Right. It's a, it's a really interesting question. I, um, I had a really fabulous guitar teacher when I was young, a teenager named James Woodward. And he kind of instilled the importance into me of knowing the notes of the fretboard and knowing what you're actually playing. Sure. Um, I think there's a tendency with a lot of guitar players to follow scale shape and boxes and you oh, yeah. know the, the yeah, kind okay. of the visual right, yeah. <laughs> right. the kind of visual element of uh, of of, uh, of guitar and um, you know he got me really into kind of jazz theory and stuff and actually knowing what you're playing and why you're picking that note and the purpose of it and um, you know we read a lot about some amazing trumpet players and sax players and things like that who obviously have, you know, finger rings and type stuff that is going on, but a lot of those really, really great jazz players know exactly what they're doing at any one time. They're not just kind of following mechanics, right? There is a purpose and a point behind everything. Absolutely. So what that was kind of good for is giving me the ability to think of music without an instrument around in a way. So I was able to kind of think about musical melodies and things like that without having an instrument there and just kind of fumbling around. So a lot of my creative process these days is still done that same way. I still kind of know what scale I need to be in or what mode I need to be in or what I need to do to get to this different position and things like that. So there's that side of it. Yep. But certainly the sort of writing music stuff, I try to always start with a groove. Um, this initial writing process is, you know, it needs to have that strong groove to begin with. I'm not even really thinking about melodies at that point. It needs to have a feel. It needs to have a groove. Once I've got that down, I'll sit down with the worst sounds I can find. The absolute horrible, <laughs> basic, bare synth sounds, a crappy kick drum, a crappy snare drum, a crappy sawtooth pad or something like that. Whatever I can find. Some really crappy sounds. And try to get that groove and the melody, whatever the melody is going to be, down at that point. Now, the reason I do that is because with those crappy sounds and that groove and that melody, you should have a recognizable piece of music to begin with. If you can hit a melody that you can sing back at that stage or a groove that you can tap your foot to at that stage, so much work as the kind of music writer is already done at that point. Everything from there is just going to improve that idea. Wonderful. If you're trying to go the other way and start with some really amazing sounds or really cool EQ settings or really cool plugins or whatever and try and work backwards and work in melodies and grooves and stuff, I find that just never really, really works for me. That's great. I, I like that analogy. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, it's it's definitely the less is more. Get get the feel of the song, the groove of the song, then the melody, and if it's working, then great. And also, it it saves time, right? Because if you do something and you don't like it, you could just move on and go to something else. As a as opposed to the situation where you spend an hour dialing up the keyboard sound only to listen to it half an hour later and go, oh, it sucks. Yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect That's sense. Like now, that being said, though, too, it's, it's important to kind of acknowledge the improvisational period as well. Sure. Sometimes just simply fooling around with some new plugins or synthesizers or whatever else you can, experimenting on the guitar, um, just going wild and, and, and going weird and things like that can yield interesting results that you wouldn't naturally kind of find if you were following that existing process. So Absolutely. while that's kind of like the base process, it's important to be really open to other possible processes as well. That's fantastic. Okay, so dumb questions because I know everybody's going to want to know, know this. What is your DAW of choice? Right. So I run a PC setup. It's really, really basic. It's kind of weird. Everybody's going to shoot me for this. But oh, no. I, um, I have a couple of different processes. So I use FL Studio and Ableton Live to generate sounds and create things. Right. And then I use Pro Tools to kind of put it all together, mix it, master it, and things like that. So it's a combination of that sort of stuff. So you're ba are you getting, you're getting your sounds in Ableton and FL Studio, they're rendering them and then pulling yep. them into Pro Tools afterwards? 
Yeah, yeah. Now, by that point, the track is already, you know, 70% written or whatever. I already have an idea of what I'm going to do for a chorus or a verse or whatever big section or whatever it might be. I've already got that idea down. So, at that point, I can start kind of producing sounds. Uh, if I'm making sounds outside of the computer, it just usually goes straight into pro, pro Tools for some processing. The reason I do it that way is I really like a lot of processing. I really like to go pretty crazy with, with stuff. And when you're trying to do everything in one session, I find the computer just, just can't handle a lot of that stuff. I like to be able to dedicate as many resources, resources as I can to that one sound, whatever it might be, whether it's a synth part or a bass part or whatever. And this isn't always the way. I'm not trying to overcomplicate things here, but I, 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 I kind of build that way because I find it allows me more freedom. If I'm trying to work in one door and trying to do everything in there, make sounds, render things out, you know, mix everything, have all my automation it ends up with this like giant confusing mess. And I find like when I used to work like that, I'd get 80% of the way through the track and all of a sudden the computer would be dying. I'd be running out of CPU stuff everywhere. I'd need to be rendering stuff out or freezing tracks anyway. So I started kind of using different, different uh, doors for different purposes. Now, FL Studio is not something I hear that often, but I know the people that use it are really passionate about it. Now, I've never used it, so could you, for, and there's probably going to be most people don't use it, so can you give me sort of an idea of what you love about it, why, what's unique about it? Yeah, I've used FL, I think, from pretty much from the beginning. It was pretty much the first uh, piece of music software that I picked up. And to me, it's really, really intuitive and really, really easy. It's very flexible. So a couple of things that you can do in FL that makes you FL really, really unique is say you have a, a part, right, a musical part, and you want to apply some automation to that part. You create, instead of an automation that's specific to that point in time, what you create is an automation clip. Think of it like a MIDI clip. It's like its own little self-contained thing. So what you can do then is copy that automation clip across or apply it to a different effect or modulate something else with it, for example. And that stuff's really powerful. Now, not only can you automate, like move that automation clip around, but you can change the way that automation clip automates something else. So say, for example, you don't want that thing to go from zero to 100%. You only want it to move a few percent, for example. You can change that very specifically over there. If you want it to be double, you know, whatever whatever moves and things are happening in that automation, you can do that sort of stuff as well. So for automation and stuff, I find FL really, really uh, awesome. What I love about FL more than anything is I click on it and within half a second, it's open. Wow. There is no, it is there. I have idea. I need to click on it straight away. It's as quick as grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil. That's what I really, really love about That's it. That's fantastic. Yeah. I think the third thing is I really love their uh, plugins. Uh, some of their synth plugins are great. Harmer is an absolutely fantastic synthesizer that comes kind What's of... What's it called? Um, sorry? With, oh, Harmer. It's called H-A-R-M-O-R. Wonderful. And uh, it's a really, really fascinating kind of synthesizer. You can do a lot of cool sort of, uh, sort of stuff with the inside Harmer and things. Um, they've got some really, really nice EQs and compressors and stuff that sort of come with it. So certainly if you're starting out, FL is a really, really good place to start. And number four is a quick little bonus one there. Mm -hmm. Once you purchase FL Studio, you have unlimited lifetime updates. So you purchase it once. Wow. And every time there's a new version, you get... As a Pro Tools a user, that's... Uh, that, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Head right, just exploded right. at that moment. <laughs> I, yeah, so those are the things I absolutely love about FL for sure. As a Pro Tools slash Waves user, <laughs> they had explodes. <laughs> I mean, I love Waves plugins. They get they get a lot of uh, you know because they're so big. You know, they get, they get that sort of corporate men, you know criticism of being very corporate. And I, I do understand. I bought Platinum when Platinum was top, was the biggest bundle, and wow. now Mercury's above that. So if I want everything in Mercury, I have to purchase more stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, obviously, if you buy FL and it keeps you up to date the whole time for a lifetime, that's remarkable. I mean, how much it's is it? I've never even looked at the price. Oh, gosh, you know, I don't even want to oh. quit. I could probably find out, but it's yeah, really not super expensive. Yeah, we'll, there's we'll a couple of different tiers. Underneath. Oh, that's cool. There's a couple of different tiers, too. There's like a beginner version, a standard position, a uh, professional sort of version, things like that. So a couple of different features and things. But yeah, lifetime free updates. How cool is that? That's insane. That's insane. <laughs> that's probably, they're probably, as a business model, regretting it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 
maybe, maybe it will maybe it will be grandfathered to you and anybody who bought it that period. Maybe in the right. future it won't be. Well, it's an interesting point you bring up. I mean, obviously, people are trying to figure out what the best way is to charge for things now. So sure. there's subscription models that are popping up. There's you know uh, updates for twelve months popping up, and then you got to pay for that. Paying for support seems to be a new one, which is kind of weird. Yeah, it's tough. I, I you know, and, and I'm not trying to bash anything because I know everybody has to figure out, we all have to figure out how to make a living. So, so there's no, you know, I, I get it, but I just, I went, I went to, um, SoundCloud pro for instance. So I bought Soundcraft, uh, SoundCloud pro. And then immediately I get an email going, Oh, for an extra $12 a month, you can get, I'm like, I just bought the pro. I, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I know, okay, I it's know. Only $12, you know, it's not going to kill you. But at the same time, you're like, when does it stop? <laughs> uh, and you think, I mean, like making music still is a niche market. It is sure. still a very, very small market. And the amount of work that goes into a piece of software like Pro Tools sure. or Logic or whatever, the amount of resources that gets dedicated to that is huge. Anybody yeah. who's ever been on the software side of things will tell you those things are so tricky. Oh, Plugins yeah. especially, yeah. So subscription model and things, I know that's been bashed a lot, but I actually don't mind the subscription thing no, that like much. Yeah, I like it. and I and, and to be honest, the the guys that I know that are doing it, that I trust, like Stephen Slate's subscription model, I mean it's a bargain. Mm. I mean he do, and he's always developing new stuff. Mm. And, um, and I don't. My guess, favorite thing about Slate stuff is I feel right, cool. I've got everything now. I've got everything I need. Yeah. And then like a week will go by, and then a Friday email comes through and says, "Hey, we've got this new plugin called Bomber. You can now download it. It's yeah. free. Check it out. Cool side check. Was cool uh, parallel compression and stuff. And there's always new stuff yeah. that they're kind of coming up with, and I really love that. I think he's doing a really good job of kind of nailing that. Yeah, he he and uh, Colin over at Mac DSP are like my two favorites because they they're they're all about. I don't know. They're just, just to me, it's thinking outside of the box. You know, not that other people don't do great plugins. The UAD stuff is fantastic. There's so much good stuff out there, and just literally within the f last five to ten years, it's just exploded. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. When I started, it was wa it was DigiDesign's obviously own plugins. Then Waves came in and really shook everything up, and then Mac DSP was the late '90s. And Mac DSP was like the first people to really do dedicated analog sounding plugins and now that's just you know the whole doors are blown off since uad and oh it's crazy i mean it's a great time to be making music somebody <laughs> interviewed me the other day and asked me a great question and said to me how does it feel to spend access to half a million dollars worth of equipment and it's the truth it's right. like when i started making music you go to a studio and there'd be like five reverbs and delays and that would be mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. And we're like, wow, we've got five different reverbs and delays. Now, of course, you open up your session and you can have like a hundred instances of different verbs and different delays and all kinds of craziness. You, know. <laughs> you don't have to reserve your compressor just for the yeah. vocals or just for the kick drum, for example. You can have as many as you like. You know, what's interesting about that, though, I was chatting with a guy the other day about this, right? And he was kind of making some really, really cool sort of industrial music in the late 90s. And I was like, man, how are you getting those guitar tones? And he was like, well, what we do is we record the guitar just direct through like an old Zoom pedal or something like that, some early digital sort of thing, right? But at the same time, we'd be tracking it through Turbo Synth, if you remember Turbo do, Synth yeah. at all. Right? Wow. <laughs> so he'd be tracking the notes of Turbo Synth. Right? Sorry, he'd be playing the guitar, and Turbo Synth would be tracking the notes of the guitar. And then running a sawtooth back through the pedal and getting these kind of big sort of synth semi sort of things. And I was like, wow, that's so inventive. I mean, that's 20 years yep. ago, right? 20 years yep. ago. Right? In the 80s, that stuff would have been as old as, you know, the Beatles, yep. right? That's how old that sort of stuff is today. It's pretty yep. crazy. And we got chatting about the kind of innovative approach that plug-in developers were doing then, and certainly in the early 2000s, treating computer digital processing as a unique thing, yep. not as a replication or a replacement for hardware. And I feel we kind of had more interesting experimental plugins six years ago, seven years ago, 10 years ago, or whatever. And I feel now we're going so much into this kind of you know, pseudo hardware sort of element with plugins and things, which is great. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that will never see a Fairchild, exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. They can have a UAD chip Fairchild and get a pretty good application for it, right? But I feel the kind of inventiveness of what a computer can do that's different to hardware has kind of fallen off by the wayside a little bit. I think bit. you're right. 
But I think there's an inevitability, and I think the great thing is I think it's going to go back there. What we're basically seeing, and this is going to really upset a lot of people, is we're seeing the replacement of the hardware. I think what Steven's doing with that virtual microphone system, it may yeah. not be perfect. But you know what? It is the future. I mean, who? I, I, I do well. You do well. But you're not going to go out and spend $35,000 on a C12. It's not going to happen. It's like even if you had that spare money, it's, it's the last thing on your list is to spend $35,000 on a microphone. Right. Exactly. So when somebody comes along like Steven and, and pretty much near as darn it simulates a C12 for $1,000 with a mic pre, I mean, that's the future. Mm. And it really is. So I do agree with you and you're perfectly right. But I think what there's doing, what was happening is the companies have, are rushing to be first with the analog replacement. Um, but I agree. I mean, I, when I think about it, I, I started, you know, probably 10 years before you. And um, what we were doing was taking the Elysis micro gates and taking the hi-hat, the live hi-hat, feeding it through there and side-chaining it with my guitars. And that was all the English dance music of the 80s, the late 80s. So you'd have that, you know, the orb stuff in the late 80s and, you know, early Prodigy and stuff was all just, it was... Really, you know, we had bad notator and original Cubase. I remember eight-bit sequences and eight, you know, eight mm -hmm. track. Like, wow! And then a sixteen-track sequencer came out, and it was like <gasps> mind-blowing. You know, it was like wow. it was pretty funny. But I think I do yeah. agree. You are right. I just think there's probably everybody's racing to try and get their analog simulation out there, knowing that. There's no kid in it or anybody in their right mind that's going to go out and collect half a million dollars worth of gear anymore. Right. You know, what's interesting about that, though, is it's kind of leveled out the playing field. What I mean by that is there was certainly a, a, a feeling, you know, in previous days where if a really good sounding record came out of a certain studio, it was because they had that $100,000 compressor or because they had that fair light. It was because of whatever. They might have had some secret Trident box or something. And the right? room. And the sound of the room. And, yeah, and the room, exactly, yeah. Whereas now, because recording equipment and musical equipment and production equipment is so kind of cheap and level, it's leveled the playing field. Now there's no excuse for somebody with a couple of hundred bucks and a computer not to be making music that pretty much sounds as sure. good as 95% of the stuff out there, right? That's a big claim, but what I mean is that it's allowed talent and skill and ideas to show through more clearly. Yeah, I, you know? agree. I agree. And, and another mm. point that I, I keep using this, so my viewers are going to be bored of me saying this, but I have a crappy Baldwin student piano called a Hamilton. And it's terrible. Half the keys are falling off. You know, it barely plays. I got it for free. It was being thrown away. Yeah. But you know what? I'm the only one who has that crappy Baldwin piano. So I think there's a sort of, there's a lot of move in LA. There's a guy called Blake Mills, who's a very trendy hip guitar player, plays on lots of people's records. He just produced a, a, a Grammy nominated album. And the thing that he's doing, um, and it's just indicative, he's kind of a, a leader in this, but he's finding like random tube amplifiers that for for things like um uh, what do you call them um uh, projectors like a projector oh cool yeah and sure plugging into that and putting that into a speaker because it's a different right. kind of circuitry so the distortion of the harmonics etc that are generated by that are very unique and don't sound like a marshall and don't sound like a fender because these days i can open up my daw and I can get the best analog simulation of the best vintage JMP ever made. And to be honest, it sounds pretty darn good. However, now everybody on the planet, as you just said, has access to those same sounds. But what they don't have is, I don't know, I'm looking around, you know, that particular <laughs> crappy amp or this guitar or whatever it is. And so I think it's definitely an interesting time. I, 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 I almost feel like in about five years' time, we'll probably be back to the world that, you, you, that you're talking about of the sort of mid-late 90s where every, all the bets were off and people were trying to do unique things because, mm. it's, you know, I always say everybody has the same sample of that beautiful Bosendorfer recorded in Vienna exactly. on this amazing stage in this beautiful room. Mm. And 20, 10, 15, 20 years ago, that was like, oh, my God, that sounds so real. Now it's like, oh... I hear that on everybody's record. 
Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, the kind of uniqueness has disappeared a little bit. And I love that inventiveness of engineers in the past and things as such. I, um, I got reading about Sean Bevan recently who uh, did a lot of cool stuff with Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn yep. Manson and things like that sort of thing in the, in the 90s. And him talking about the guitar tone that he got on Antichrist Superstar with Marilyn Manson, um, that kind of beautiful people guitar tone. Right, guitar tone. And... Um, yeah, right, absolutely. Yeah. It's huge and kind of industrial, but at the same time still had that kind of definition coming yep. through. And I was reading about how he did that, and it was recording the guitar parts twice as fast an octave up to tape at 30 inches per second, right? And then playing it back at 15 inches per second. So therefore it would be, you know, an octave down and then the, the speed of the song. And just to get that super grittiness, and that was That's cool. I tried doing that stuff recently and it still works. It still is a great, great sound that you cannot do in plugins. You cannot record something at a higher sample rate and then kind of pitch it down. It get, It's a totally different sound. Totally, totally different. Stephen Slate is watching this interview and he is now <laughs> developing that plugin. You, you know that. <laughs> Right, I will beta test that one, Stephen. Send it to me, Ste please. Stephen, he won't mind me telling you this, but this is this is what Stephen does. He wakes up in the morning, and I, he does it every time, and he goes... Does he wake up? I think he's awake I think he's all awake. the time. He's he sleeps. Something. I think you have to sleep to yeah. wake up, right? Yeah. <laughs> he, and, he, and he has this idea, and then he announces it the same, like 20 minutes after he has the idea, and then for the next six months, he develops the, the idea. Wow. I mean, he, no, he literally does that. You're the, he'll be like, I think this would be amazing. Announces it, does pre-sales, markets it, talks about it all the time while wow. developing it and then launches it. He's, it sounds like the video game industry right there. Ah, really? Is, <laughs> well, look, you, you, almost, you and I can almost. talk about this stuff all day and we probably will come back to it. So, But um, I know a lot of people are going to watch this are going to want to know about the video game industry because... I frankly know nothing about it except living vicariously through my son and, you know, I don't have any time to play video games anymore. I'm, I'm multitasking this and making records and all stuff. Right. So, <laughs> so what is it like? I mean, you just made a joke about it. I mean, it's uh, – uh, do they come to you when the game is finished? Do they come to you very early on in the process or is it all of the above? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of all of the above. You really don't want to be coming in when the game is yeah. finished. Um Pretty much, I mean, you know, people ask, oh, is it fun to play the game before it comes out? And the truth of that answer is, like, not really. The game, when it comes out, that's when it's finished, right? The game that you are playing a week ago probably wasn't that fun to play, and now it's fun to play, and therefore it's, it's kind of yeah. released. So we don't really do that. But no, typically, so, um, you know, a, a lot of time I try to get in as early as possible. I try to get at least 18 months of development time. Wonderful. I find at that point the team has pretty much decided what sort of game they want to do on paper and you can be part of the team as they kind of discover that and carry through that process and that's really important um but yeah what's it like i don't know it's um the the biggest difference i think between making music for video games and making music for any other purpose is that music is 50 percent of the process right so that 50 percent of the process is exactly the same as whatever else you do whether you're making beats and throwing it up onto soundcloud whether you're producing high grammy nominated uh, you know tracks and things like that whatever music for film it's exactly the same as that and then there's this whole other unique element very specific to video games which is the interactivity element. So that's where, when the player does this, the music changes to that. When the player does this, the music changes to that. And creating that system, making music that works with that system, making music that works with that system that is rewarding to the player is kind of the stuff that's unique to the video game wow. industry for sure. That's mm. pretty cool. So, so that means then you're not just writing a piece of music. I'm assuming, and I'm naive at this, so you can correct me in all of the wrong things I'm about to say. Um, <laughs> so if they go off and do something, if the track might continue to play, but elements change and evolve and all this kind of stuff. So you right. presumably are creating a lot of stems, a lot of different alternate mixes of things that do different things, as opposed to just like, a theme that runs, you know, for four hours while the guy's playing the game. Pretty much, kind of, it's, the technology these days has gotten so good that we can do this stuff in real time. 
Oh, wow. So the way I like to approach it is I still treat music the way that music, I believe, is intended to be treated, which is you have verse-like structures, yep. you have chorus-like structures, and you have build-ups and transitions into those right. things. Now, this isn't necessarily something that applies just to pop music. Even if you're writing an orchestral score, you have the element of that orchestral score that plays the role of the chorus. You have the element of that orchestral score that plays the role of the verse, whether there's lyrics or whatever. Those things still have that. Basically, we're talking about an emotional intensity change, right? Sure. So I still write and approach music in that way. Then what we try to do is hand the change of that over to the player's actions. So when the player does something really amazing and we want to kind of reward them for something, that's when the music kicks up. I see. Now, typically how we achieve that isn't always just by having stems and kind of layering more stuff on top of each other. I actually don't like that method because the player can't really feel it happening. It's a very transparent way of doing it. Um, I feel sometimes in the game industry, we get too obsessed with the technicalities of what's actually happening behind the scenes. And we forget to acknowledge whether that's actually paying off or not. It's that kind of form follows function kind of thing, um, which, which I disagree with. I believe we should always have that kind of, you know, emotional response from the, from the form should be number one. Absolutely. So when we just, if you've got a kick drum track, right, and then you layer a bass part over the top of that, there's a little bit of a change, but not that much. If then on top of that, you layer in some guitars or whatever, and then you bring in some sort of, you know, high violin part or whatever, the track doesn't really feel like it's going anywhere. It's just getting more dense, right? Now, dense is an interesting word there because what we're actually doing by doing this is adding more sound into the mix. This is happening at the point where more stuff is happening in the game. So you can see where I'm going with this. When we have more things that are happening in the game, there's going to be more sounds. When we're adding more music, it all just starts to get like pretty messy, sure. right? So instead what I do is break the music into chunks, into segments, right? And I can create, say, 50 variations on a verse. And then what we do is throw them into a container and those, vari those uh, verse variations just randomize. Then when the player does something really cool and we want to kick up to the chorus, it dumps out that container, plays a little transition and brings in the chorus. Those choruses can randomize for as long as they need to, and then it dumps back down into the verse when we need to do that. That's obviously a very rudimentary and basic way of kind of explaining it, but the, the concept is the same even though we extrapolate it out into ridiculous amounts of time. That's great. So it's not just an 8-bit going beep, beep, boop, boop. No. <laughs> what was cool about that stuff, though, is I can actually see us in the future going back to that. I'm not talking about 8-bit bloops or anything right. like that. The idea of having a MIDI track or something like a MIDI track, a tracker, yeah. playing in the background that was triggering sounds, that was essentially what was happening. Even though a lot of that stuff was hard-coded and then as technology progressed, they actually had samples on a chip that were being triggered at certain things. Um, I think that technology is probably going to come back. That example that I explained just before about, say, verses going into chorus is limiting in the fact that you've always got a verse at that tempo and you've always got a chorus at that tempo. Now, if all of a sudden that stuff is being triggered in real time via MIDI, so if your kick drum part and your snare part and your bass part is all being played in real time using samples that exist on a disc via a MIDI track that's running in the background, we can do all sorts of cool stuff. We can speed the music up. We can slow it down. We can treat things that are happening in the game as automation parameters to change, say, the cutoff of a filter or something like that. So there's all sorts of possibilities that open up. So it's almost like I think that technology will, co will come back in a big way. That makes perfect sense. It's so, well, it's a lot more involved than I would have anticipated. But I, I like that. Um, and I like the fact that you can take traditional thinking and then imply you know employ it in a new way because that probably helps you out mentally where you sit there and think of like verse chorus and transitions um the experience i've seen when i watch my son playing games because i don't get like i said i don't get much of a chance to play myself <laughs> is I, I find it quite remarkable how well it integrates because most of the time uh, most of the time I'm not noticing it unless I don't think that it works. Now, that may be not be much of a compliment in some ways, but sometimes I'm like, I've played, I can't remember what game he was playing. It wasn't one of yours. It was something else. And I remember being like, what, what are they doing? You know? Right. And, and a lot of the time I think when they use like a, a semi-famous or famous band's track in there, I don't know if that works enough for me. 
I think that what you do makes much more sense and probably why you're successful at it because, um, you know, I know there was a spate. I think it was probably late 90s, wasn't it? I remember about the late 90s. Everything was, that was another sort of new gold rush for bands and record labels were trying to get their bands into video games. I do remember that period of PlayStation 2 when it launched in early 2000s, I think, had a lot of other bands, indie bands and stuff on it. But I've noticed the better games don't do that. And I'm sorry if that's going to mm. annoy people. But I feel like the care and the attention, like you're saying, 18 months getting in that long, that's why it starts to really, really work. And when I say I don't notice it, what I mean is is it makes sense, the visual and the music and everything there. Because the last thing you want to do is have something that doesn't work at all and it takes you out of that zone. The music right. has to support the zone. Like when you go and see a great movie... If the music is incredible, it just tells the same story, doesn't it? The music right, is telling right. the emotion. You're, it's, it's helping the euphoria. You don't stop and go, wow, what incredible music this is. Oh, I missed that scene. Right. If it's doing the best. <laughs> right, I mean, that only works in a montage. Yeah, exactly. Or, right? or an end credit sequence. If it's doing the right job and you're doing an amazing job, you're enhancing what's going on. And yes, you could stop and admire the music or you can stop and admire the graphics or whatever. But ultimately, if it's doing the the right job, it's just, you know, you're doing the job because that, that gamer is like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's to say that stuff can't work as well. I mean, there's a couple of situations where that sort of thing can work really, really well. A couple of years ago, I worked on a racing game and, um, uh, uh, Shift to Unleashed, it was right. called, and the uh, the audio director behind that's an absolute genius, and um, he came up with this brilliant idea of taking music from bands. We got about ten songs from memory, and then employed a bunch of different sort of music producers, myself and a bunch of other people, to kind of do remixes of these tracks. Right. Some were done in a big industrial, aggressive way. Some were done in a big gladiatorial, orchestral right. way. Some were done in a more subtle way. But it was always the same track. And we got a whole bunch of cool bands on board. There was 30 Seconds to Mars and Rise Against and a couple of other really, really awesome bands that gave us a couple of their songs and the stems and things. We were able to kind of remix this sort of thing. So then what happened is in the game, when, when, when the emotional intensity was changing, we'd have different elements and different remixes actually coming oh. in. So the, the band's song was still the same but it still it had like our remixes and stuff that were doing it but it was able to fit within the game's sort of way of doing like things that. so it, yeah. it certainly can be done yeah i like mm. that i think you're hitting the nail on the head it's it's being able to you know be able to mold that for the scenes and the and, and the action that's actually happening i think where the thing that put me off in those late 90s where you just had that band track playing on loop right which was you know i mean <laughs> i know we've moved right. past that so, so. decades ago but it's, right. <laughs> it was pretty funny it was just like this minute and a half piece of, of whatever alternative band was hip that week playing for, for two hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> just like, well, that's another point too, is that like sometimes if you take a top 10 band or whatever might be cool yeah. at the moment, they don't necessarily want to hand their nicely recorded, you know, Warren Hewitt produced track over to somebody like me and I'll go, right, I'll chop out the verses and I'll chop out the choruses and then I'll leave it up to the player to trigger those things when that sort of stuff happens. I mean, if I was writing my music and pouring all my money and energy and things into that, I wouldn't want somebody like me to chopping it up either so i can kind of understand the reservations that sort of thing too music is not a job it's a lifestyle totally it's totally, a, it's totally, a really totally, is a lifestyle totally. this this for us is a it's a lifestyle choice so we need spouses yeah. and girlfriends that really get us yeah you know, totally, and it's got totally, nothing totally. to do with financial success i mean i've been i've made good money and i've had times earlier in my career where i was making nothing and the, the difference is I, i'm just as obsessed both ways yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's a good way to be, and I think you've got to keep that too. Yeah. I think you've got to have that. I mean, I think I almost feel like maybe I'm wrong, you know, back on the record, I feel like, um, you know, even our heroes that we grew up listening to, I, I think the ones that eased off, and, we, you know, there's, there's the guys like David Bowie who never eased off, who just kept their foot on the gas pedal, and, yeah, um, and then guitar players like Jeff Beck who have never eased off and are still making great records and still touring like crazy. And then there are, and I'm not going to name them because they're so obvious, then there's all the other legacy artists that eased off and they, they put out stuff and you're just like, you, could, you know, right. they're, they're trying to be hip. Uh, you know, mm. the, the, guys that, well, the guys and girls that we love just make music because they make music. They're not chasing mm. top 10 success. They just make great music. And um, 
they're the ones that never eased off. They're still working long hours. They're still passionate. And yeah, that's, that's the stuff I gravitate towards. That's totally true. Music definitely has to be the thing yeah. you do. I think on top of that too, like one of my favorite quotes, and I'm going to paraphrase it really, really horribly. <laughs> That's okay, but I do it all Frank day. Zappa who <laughs> said, right? <laughs> but no, Frank Zappa who Love said, Zappa. if you knew that nobody was going to listen to the music that you were writing, if you're going to make a song and knew that nobody was ever going to hear it, make that song, work on that, do that project. Yeah. And I kind of love that philosophy of, 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 of approaching your work in a kind of unique way. I think it would be, I don't know what it must have been like for certain people, I guess, to have like a hit record at 16, 17 or, or 18 or whatever and become so successful so early in their life. Because everything else they do from that point is kind of, you know, measured against that. Sure. When that first initial album that they were putting together was, was gone at in a complete openness, right? And you lose that when that success kind of comes, I guess. So, uh, yeah, I love, that. I love that way of putting it. It's just make that music like you think nobody's going to hear it. Yeah, and I agree. I, I actually, I was, as you were saying that quote, and I don't remember that quote, so thanks for, letting, for telling me that. <laughs> that was a great quote. I, I was mm. thinking an, um, another way to also think about that quote and twist it is like ask yourself the question, would you still do music if you knew that nobody right. was going to listen to it? Right. Because I think that yeah. for, for those of us that kept, kept going and have done through all of this and, you know, people that are currently in the industry, like I, I know a lot of like record company executives and stuff. They, they, they move into like real estate you know, wow, and I yeah. realized that, you know, they were A&R guys because they could make a lot of money by having a Rolodex and having lunch. Right. Um, you know, and then right. there's some A&R guys that carry on as managers. And I look at them mm. and I go, ah, I respect you because you just want to be in music. So now, now you're managing artists and developing artists. And the ones that went off to be real estate guys, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but there's no way, you know, um, if God forbid anything physical happened to me and I couldn't play an instrument, I'd still be doing music. You know, yeah, totally, totally, totally. I don't, totally, totally. don't invite that 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 catastrophe. But my point is, is like, right. well, my really. point is, is like, that, this is when I was a kid. It was Queen were my band, and I remember just like headphones mm. on and just obsessed before I, and that was that was sort of pre eleven years old, before, pre knowing anything about girls. You know, so I wasn't motivated yeah, yeah, yeah. to be in a band to show off to girls. I wasn't. I hadn't discovered <laughs> alcohol. I wasn't partying. You know, it was right. just because I love music. And, mm, you know, mm. this is definitely – and it's great to, to talk to, to you because, you know, you've made a career out of a site, especially as a guitar player, because most people associate, mm. you know, video game, games probably with keyboard players and programmers. Right. And, uh, but it's interesting. A lot of guitar players are, are starting to, you know, get into this or have been in doing this for, for – for many years, which isn't traditional because it was always the MIDI world was firmly keyboard players. It wasn't right. us. And and also the other thing that's exciting is that you're not predominantly a Pro Tools guy because I didn't start using DAWs until Pro Tools because I was messing around with Cubase and Notator and all the other Steinberg product uh, products, but I found like for me, they didn't go with the guitar player brain. It annoyed me that I couldn't edit audio in the same way that keyboard players could edit their sounds but when pro tools came right, along right, sure. i could cut out a piece of audio and copy and paste it in the same way a keyboard player could do that with midi and i was like yeah for sure you know yeah 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 totally totally good. well i think there's a couple of things with that too is like what coming back to what we were talking about before now is the easiest time ever to get into producing music it is really 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 quite simple you honestly do not even need that hardcore amounts of theory and things that goes into writing say for example classical music now i'm not taking anything away from that and there is certainly a point in your career where you'll find that you will be hitting blocks and to get around those blocks, learning theory and learning what's actually going on with music or frequencies or whatever it might be, learning definitely comes into it. Sure. But experimenting and opening up a laptop and opening up FL Studio or Live or whatever and making some beats and things like that has never been easy before. I've given my brother, who's completely not into music whatsoever, um, you know, FL Studio for half an hour and I said, man, just click on things and just see what happens, right? And he will come up with a 4-4 beat. It'll have a groove. He'll know when that kick drum is not 
not on beat number one, he'll know to move it a little bit. He kind of intuitively, you know, music has never been that easy to get into, yep. right? So that's really, really cool. The second thing, just coming back to one of the points you made there about being a guitar player and stuff like that, I, I love guitar. I love love guitar so much. I've been playing guitar a long, 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 long time. Um, all the music I listen to is guitar-based. I still love that sort of stuff so much. That being said, though, I don't think about my stuff as a guitar player at all. I just think of it as, as music. And the guitar for me is a way that I can kind of capture whatever's happening up here or whatever is happening out there and kind of transfer it through to get it get it out. So when I'm putting guitar into a track or whatever in a video game, I'm not trying to win one for guitar or bring back metal or any of that sort of stuff, right? I'm simply just trying to use that as a either an emotional uh, purpose or a mix purpose, yeah. right? So much of that guitar distorted tone that we love evolved to suit a purpose within a, an audio spectrum, right? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, if, I'm, if I've got a gap in that spectrum, I'll start looking for, for guitar. It might not be guitar. It might be a really distorted synthesizer. It might be a baritone sax in a similar sort of range or a tenor sax in a similar sort Absolutely. of range. Um, and that sort of stuff, yeah. So I think it's important, like, while you might be into guitar or MIDI or keyboards or whatever, or even a drummer, to think of yourself as a musician as a whole and think about music as a whole thing and not just about the instrument that you play really well, for example. I mean, you're basically, you know, not basically, you are exactly talking like a producer. Right. <laughs> but you are. I mean, you're, you're, you're right. a composer, obviously. You know, if somebody was to say, what does he do? It would probably be Mick Gordon, composer for video. That's what people would, would probably just quickly surmise you as. But ultimately, so sure. you're, you're a producer. You're thinking entirely like a producer. And I think that's, uh, you know, as well as the composer and the musician that's playing the instruments. And I think that that's really very exciting and why I'm very excited to talk to you because you're, everything you're talking about is all about production. Beyond the initial idea of writing the songs and the grooves and everything else after that is all production elements. And it's really valuable stuff, whether you're writing music for video games or for bands or solo artists, mm. or whatever it might be, you are, this is production stuff, and it's very exciting. Because I think of the guys that I admire, you know, st historically, one of the, the people I always come back to in the back of my mind and forget to name check on a regular basis is Brian Wilson. When I listen to the mm. Beach Boys stuff, bearing in mind that they were recording on four tracks for most of their big mid-60s stuff, one of the beautiful things he did, and it, it was echoed by you when you were talking about the area where you put the guitar, is he, he would choose instruments specifically on their on their frequency res responses and their ranges. Right. So it'd be like, oh yeah, you know, right. and he'd have all these elements, and it was it, yeah. because they they didn't sit there with like you know eight band parametric EQs. They didn't have right. a, a Renaissance compressor, <laughs> right. you know, where you could sit and pull up like a band about this narrow <laughs> and pull out frequencies. And car, because right. these days, you know, we can take uh, in EDM, we can take any synth and just cut out 1K and slot something so in. I'm sure you, you have to do that when you've got really dense sections of songs. Um, obviously, totally. in those days, they couldn't do that. So they had to think of what instrument to pick and where to put it. So I love that. I mean, that, that to me was great production in the 60s. And it, what, it's what makes production great now yeah. is not leaving it all up to the mix. Right, but right. Making those choices right. in the composition and the production of the songs. You know, let's take that analogy even Please. further, way, 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 way earlier than the 60s, for example, with classical, broke, yeah. um, uh, you know, orchestrations, right? The orchestrator was the first mixing engineer, or orchestration was the first mixing technique, I Absolutely. should say. You would sit down as a composer, traditional composer, is sit down at a piano and come up with your melodies and such, and then have a great big giant score in front of you and say, right, how am I going to illustrate this part? How am I going to illustrate this part? If I have this note here, which is a semitone too close to this note, I need to split those an octave apart. I will choose that instrument for that. I will choose that instrument for that. If you didn't, you would have a clash. 
There was no mixing then. It was all done on the fly. It was the arrangement of the orchestra. It was where people sat in the room. It was the auditorium itself. But ultimately, it was the arrangement that somebody had put together. So that idea of illustrating melody or musical voices in a, in a, in a technical way has been around since, you know, Absolutely. long, long, long time. Yeah, for sure. No, it's wonderful. I love that analogy. I grew up on classical music. My, my father is a huge right. classical buff. And that's actually the reason why I got into Queen, because that was the only band that he considered to be close enough to classical music for me to listen to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, studying that sort of stuff is so interesting. But when I'm listening to that stuff, I'm trying not to find the latest 2016 version recording of that. I try to find the earliest. And the reason I do that is often it was one microphone, some RCA 44 or whatever it might have been stuck in the room recording the orchestra. And you can still hear the entire melody. You can hear, hear the harmony that's sitting in there. And that is not the work of the, of, the, of the mixing engineer. That is not the work of the equipment that they were using. That is the work of the arrangement itself. And that's so important. And that stuff is still relevant yep. today with what we do. I love that you're mm. touching on this because it opens lots of, lots of wonderful areas for me. Um, there's... There's very, unfortunately, as we know, there's very few recordings of, of great classical composers because there's not that many that were alive by the time recording came in. But I know, um, speaking as an Englishman, there's a very early recording of Elgar recording, you know, uh, conducting Pomp and Circumstance, you know, the dum dum wow. da, 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 da. Yeah. And in his, in his score, it allows for rubato. And for those of us that uh, you watch and don't know what rubato is, is that's, Beethoven made very famous with huge tempo changes, you know, a, a sort of a free time. I don't know what the exact Italian uh, uh, translation is, actually, to be honest. But I think free time is probably <laughs> the best way of describing it. And right. in Pomp and Circumstance, there's one recording of Elgar, record, you know, conducting his own piece of music. And the mm. tempo changes are enormous. They are like, don't. And just, but it, you listen to it and it's so emotional and it's so driven and it's interesting because you know as we as we move into this world as we know of everything being on the grid and the infinite possibility of timing things and making them perfect we have to remember that oh, here's another example I, um, I, I did X Factor for a couple of years as a staff producer and they asked me to do Back in Black they wanted to do back and back. Oh, cool. So I thought Mutt Lang, of all guys, you know, was, wow. you know, Mutt Lang is like probably one of the most, you know, a great band from Australia. Surgical. Yeah, you'd think yeah. so. <laughs> so I loaded in back and black and I put it into Pro Tools and I put a tempo map against it. There is no oh, steady so. tempo in that song. Mm. I didn't know that. Mm. I didn't even think twice about it. It comes on the radio. You just didn't know. Get on it. Get on it. You know, yeah. you just, you, you're like, you just think yeah. it's going to be Mutt Lang. It's going to be kick, snare, kick, snare. Yeah. It isn't. It's not even that it, it's, it, it speeds up, slows down, speeds up, slows down. And yet there's no point listening to that song where I feel like it's too slow or it's too fast. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it was a beautiful experience for me because I mm -hmm. thought Mutt Lang, of all people, was going to be the most anal producer ever. And, right. And yeah, 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 he yeah. is, but he is in the right way. You know, he knows mm -hmm. where to... Now, now what's, what's cool about that, though, too, is that it's intentional, yeah. right? And the reason I can tell you that it's an intentional is that if anybody who's ever played in a band before yeah. and has been to a band rehearsal and will play a song, no matter what it is, doesn't matter, let's pick Sweet Home Alabama, yeah. we will start with the... Dun, dun, ga -ga, dun, 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 right, cool. By the end of the track, it's twice yeah. as fast Sweet as that. Sweet Home Alabama. It's, yeah, it's like... Right. Yeah. Of yeah. course. Now, when you're playing that... Right, and then the drummer says, okay, guys, that was really, really good. Let's do it again. When you start that track again, you don't start at the original tempo. You start at the tempo that you just finished yeah. with, right? So when they were in the studio recording that stuff, we know that that was take after take after take. Let's do it again, guys. Let's do it that. Each time they were doing that, they were going back to the original tempo, whatever felt natural at that time, and then speeding up through the process. Yeah. They went stuck at that tempo at the end and then began from that point there, yeah. right? So that stuff was intentional. We've totally lost that for sure. Yeah, it's – yeah, I, I think, I think you know, because you're talking about the plugins and the way that, you know, people at the moment, it's all about analog simulation, which I know we both understand because it's it, – we're getting to that point now where you know, I'm looking around, they have a – 
couple of nice mic pre's here in the studio in Nashville. They have a Chandler here, and you know they have some nice stuff. And I do believe in good front end. I think there's certain things that are not at the moment completely replaceable, but they will be replaced. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. I'm looking for. I think we're in a very creative space. I think it's a little reactionary at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure how you feel about the music industry. It feels like we've either got super overproduced pop music, or really indie schmindy kind of like I don't care if I'm in tune. Um, right. <laughs> I think it's a little bit like that at the moment, and I think that's just reactionary because a lot of people are tired of turning on the radio and hearing everything go. You know, hearing that kind of production. Right. Um, but you, you said it multiple times during this, the, the technology is available for us to do either of those. Mm, yeah, for now, sure. Now, for you then, because we're on tempos and stuff, is that a quotient? Mm. Is that a part of what you do? Is there, would you take a piece of music and drastically change the tempo at certain things? I, yeah, I mean, it, it depends. A lot of the sort of technology that we're using yeah. can have... Uh, beat points, right? So we can set a tempo that says, I don't know, 128 beat per minute, right? We'll choose a dance thing. Yep. And that when we fire off that transition, so when we say, right, using our example from earlier, we want to go from the verse to the chorus, we set the system to make sure that it changes on the beat. That way we don't miss beats and things sure. like that, right? So it's really, really obvious, that sort of stuff. When working to that framework, it's important to kind of have a pretty solid tempo. That being said, though, that we don't always do that. Sometimes we can manually pick where it's going to happen so we can actually have a little marker within the file itself and we uh, fire off an event change, we call it, or whatever it might be, but basically it says, right, we need to change the music now. What it'll do then is wait until the music actually hits that marker before changing on to the next thing so we can definitely do that um i did some hip-hop stuff like two years ago and um i found like the 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 thing that i was trying to do it needed a swing feel right but the kind of stock standard you know triplet feel that 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 that, 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 that when that was on the grid it does not feel no, right no, whatsoever it feels terrible triplets and swing is such a natural feel and um the way i ended up doing it's probably kind of a sneaky way of doing it but i found these old like you know 90s or early late 80s actually um sort of hip-hop stuff you know where the guys would have played the the beat on pads did, and yeah. stuff like that to get the yeah. feel right so i took some of that stuff in and then i kind of measured up against where those beats landed and um, and then built a grid around that right. basically, and then I was able to kind of line up everything on that. So you get so much of a like groovier feel that way. You Pharrelled it because um, real like it, oh sorry please you Pharrelled it. Right, <laughs> maybe <laughs> is that what that's called? I just think that's a, it sort of yeah. After that lawsuit. <laughs> right. Oh gosh. <laughs> no no no! I didn't like sample no, anything. No, no, no. That's what sort of Pharrelled is. He took the song and he used the groove of the song. Wow. That was, that was the whole lawsuit, wasn't it? It was about, it felt the was same. It, I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of worrying. I never compelled. <laughs> Does anybody own a groove? That's kind of yeah, crazy. I don't, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm, I'm off on a tangent, but, but I, lo I love what you're talking sure. about. That makes absolutely perfect sense. And you're 100% right. My friend Greg actually worked on uh, It Takes a Nation of Millions. I don't know if he was an assistant on it or, or an engineer, but he told me that was all played by Hammer or an NPC. So they would sit there, mm. and the reason why it feels so good and why early hip hop without a doubt is incredible is because it's the mm, t, da, mm, totally t, da, mm, mm, absolutely as opposed to do, do, da, do, you know it, exactly because exactly. there's guys playing in in real time and even if they had a click mm. track they were pushing and pulling like human beings do so that's that's mm. really smart I, like, I, I love to hear that you do that and you're right there's nothing I had a whole discussion with my old engineer who actually used to live in Nashville and was texting me as we were talking and uh, he swears blind as a drummer that 6A is just triplets that, uh, that can be measured. And I'm like, no way. I'm like, put in, you know, <laughs> here I stand, head in. Right. It's, oh, totally. Oh, oh, oh. It yeah. just does not. You, it's not this, because he swear blind that an eighth note is an eighth note. Bang, right. da, 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 da. I'm like, no way. I'm like, yeah, I used to think, I used to think similar, especially when I was a teenager and practicing guitar, you're working stuff to a metronome, you're practicing your, your six toplets, you're pack, practicing your quintuplets sure. or whatever. And the, the goal at that time was to be pure mechanical. Sure. It was six notes per beat, right? Needing to be very, very exact. And when you kind of produce music, you kind of float to with that same thing. And people would say when you're playing like really, really accurate six toplets, oh, that's really tight. Yeah. But the definition of tight to me is very different now. If I think of tight now, I think of, you know, James Brown's big band oh, yeah. or whatever playing 
every single note together in their own universal tempo, in their own universal feel, whatever felt good at the moment at that time. That's tightness. When you hear, a, you were talking about um, uh, orchestral music that moves and things oh, yeah. around before, some of the tightest oh. players on earth play in a live orchestra. If you're playing in an orchestra with 50, 60, 100 other people, your stuff needs to be super tight yeah. as well. So that's really, 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 really quite cool stuff. Um, onto that sort of thing though, before I found this really, really cool technique recently to get um, drummers, right? Drummer, every drummer I know hates a click track, right? Uh, you've probably been the same. Every single drummer I know, every single drummer I've, I've worked with has always hated a click track. So I was trying to get away that sort of thing and try to figure out like a different way of doing it. And we, we discovered that like if you, if you, instead of feed them a click track, right? Certain drummers, whatever, instead find a delay, right? Uh, an echo that's at a quarter note or whatever it might be, the tempo, whatever you need to be. And instead of feeding the drummer a click track, feed them a quarter note echo of what they're playing. So when they hit the snare, a quarter note later, that snare bounces back as an echo, oh, wow. right? What will happen is you'll get the drummer grooving within themselves. And it works so much better than them trying to go, oh, now I'm ahead of the beat, I'm behind the beat, hang on, where am I? And that sort of thing. That's pretty, uh, that, that's good. I've actually never thought of that. Mm, super cool. I might super edit cool. that piece out and just keep it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's sharing this no, is what know, we I'm do teasing. right that's, that's i mean we're all just trying way. to figure this stuff out as we go yeah. right you know and sharing ideas and stuff yeah. like that that's kind of how how things progress from no, here I agree. right it's all, that's this your whole yeah, show. No, it's all about collaboration and community i i i've learned through trial and error and just through there's there's no such thing as dilution i listen to everybody is involved however i'm sure actually this is probably a great question to ask you because you are working with huge companies. Mm. So do you get to that situation? How do they operate, especially the ones that you, and you don't have to be specific about names of companies. That's not, not my point. When you work with a company that's, say, you know, a really a great company to work with, which I'm sure is many companies, do you find that they have a handful of key people that you deal with or are they working more on a committee basis? Because I find sometimes... Working with artists, for me, the most successful artists, and when I mean successful, I'm not just always talking about money. I'm talking about, like, great music. The more successful ones have a very, very small, narrow group of people that they go to. Sometimes they don't go to anybody, and then occasionally they go to one or two people. I find that the artists, the, the more difficult and less successful, and I get the worst results out of farming out to a thousand people for different views and then come back with reams of notes most of which are counterproductive and um right so but that's artists and that's <laughs> artists and a and r guys and managers now with you you're dealing with video games companies what's sort of your experience yeah so i mean music is a really really interesting thing to talk about to begin with there is a certain language that you can use with other musicians that helps illustrate the point that you're trying to get across the moment you bring in non-musicians, um, the conversation really does need to change. Yeah. So a lot of the time, especially video game music, it's important to understand that you are providing music as a service. Sure. And I, I use that phrase in a way of humbling anybody that I'm kind of trying to work with. Um, you might be the most incredible recording musician that has existed on earth, but you have to slot within the, 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 all the other people. And the why I say that is that you're on a team with some of the best artists in the world, some of the best designers in the world, some of the best programmers in the world. The, the creative teams that we're working with who might be 100, 200, up to 500, 600 people are the best in you know the, the, the video game space. Some of the artists and things especially, I would call the best in the world, especially the technical people are some of the best in the world. It, yeah. So when you're coming into that, you've got to be very aware of who you're kind of working with. Now, of course, very similar to like you said there, everybody has an opinion on music. Everybody has an idea about what's going to be the best music for the game. And certainly I've walked into studios before and you have a chat with the art director and they're always, you know, got black hair and black t-shirts and listening to nothing but Norwegian death metal. And all they want is Norwegian death metal. <laughs> You'll go to the programmers and they're listening to 90s techno. So they want it to sound like 90s techno. You go to the producer and the producer's often a little bit older. The producer might be an old Beatles fan and he really loves the Beatles and he might want some Beatles in there or whatever, right? 
And your job is to kind of distill down, okay, what does the art director love about Norwegian black metal? What does the programmer love about 90s tech metal? What, whatever, uh, techno. And kind of see if there's any similarities and things between this sort of stuff. Now, when I'm saying similarity, similarities, I'm not saying, oh, they're all at 100 beats per minute, so we'll make tracks at 100 beats per minute and we'll be fine. No, it's trying to look at why the artist feels that that type of music is appropriate. Because I can tell you that artist who's into Norwegian black metal isn't into metal as such. He doesn't care about guitar tones. She doesn't care about kick drums or whatever. They're into that music because it gives them a emotional response. And if it's eliciting a really strong emotional response, then what they actually mean is they want the music in the game to elicit an emotional response. So at that point, we're not talking about genres, we're not talking about speed, we're not really talking about any sort of specific musical terms, we're talking about emotional reaction terms. Super, super quick, the way video games work, right, is you have stimuli, you have action, and you have feedback. So the stimuli could be something happening within the game. That causes the player or says to the player, you need to do something. It's an action, it calls for an action. And then there's feedback that occurs from that, right? You get some sort of reward for doing that sort of thing. And that's all a video game is. It's just an endless cycle of that. So initially, you're seeing where music fits within that feedback circle is super, super important to find out what sort of emotional responses you're going to be kind of eliciting. That's pretty amazing. I love that. And, but I do understand because, you know, even doing just music with a, with a band, within that band, you've got those three, four, five, six different opinions. You know, because quite often the guitar player will come along and go, I want Metallica guitar tone. Which, of course, is right. this, this huge block of... <laughs> gah, 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 gah. Right. And then the drummer will come, come along and play you, you know, John Bonham's drums, which is huge, ambient, open space. You can hear the air on the front head of the kick drum, that boo. And then the singer will come along and want something, like, with tons of air around it as well. And the bass player will come along and want huge fat with distortion. And you're like, well, this is interesting because in a, the, the ultimate response would be like, well, okay, you can't have guitars that take up 90% of the sonic spectrum at the same time as drums that take up 90%, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, but you're right. What do they mean? I actually had a mixer once say to me, this is an interesting one. He was working with a famous producer and the famous producer came in and played him Green Day and said, I like the energy of this song. And the mixer was having to mix a Jewel song in the 90s. Yeah, totally. Now, yep. Jewel, you know, you were meant for me. It was like acoustic. <clears throat> and the mixer said that it was completely confusing on a logical state of view of like, well, obviously, Green Day is like heavy, distorted punk rock guitars, you know, with mm. bridge pickups going, gang, 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 gang. And Jewel is ding, jinga, ding, jinga. But he okay. understood what he meant. He understood mm, what he meant. Mm. That he wanted this sort of excitement to be brought out. And that can be like some distorting things lightly. Like if you lightly distort every instrument and vocal a little bit on everything, the end is it's just it feels just a little bit more edgy, a little bit more distorted. And Sorry. it makes it a little bit more dangerous sounding than just a pretty vocal acoustic guitar. And right. so I get what you're saying. It's like finding that common ground. In fact, and it's definitely a metaphor for communicating with people, isn't it? What do they say? You know, look for the similarities, not the differences. Right, yeah. for sure, it's like, for sure, where for does sure. It cross over? That being said, too, oh, yeah, so no, for sure. So like that being said, though, too, like it's, all, it's important to understand that you do bring your own knowledge and experience and things like that, too. And I'm, I'm, these days I kind of try to have a really strong philosophy that – if I feel it's a good idea and if the people that I'm working with feel it's a good idea, but there's somebody on the team that's kind of fighting it and wants to go in a different direction, I've, I've gotten better at kind of getting confident enough to say, look, I, I, I disagree. Here are the reasons why. Tell me your reasons why you disagree and then see if we can come and kind of work out some sort of thing. But if there is no reason, I think it's important to acknowledge that that's not going to be the best sort of situation for you in your working situation career. 
Um, and, you know, you kind of finish up with that, that sort of thing amicably, of course, and move on. And you really want to be finding those people that are, you know, into those cool ideas, those different sure. ideas, those ideas that really push the boundaries, um, that don't have to follow the conventions of everything that's kind of been done in, in the past, right? So I think that's super, super important too. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day on a video game project, you have either a producer or a creative director who sits at the top and kind of overlooks all the creative decisions. Decisions, and ultimately, they're the one that you have to get your stuff uh, passed. Uh, and then, of course, we have the, the the zeitgeist, right, or whatever you want to call it. That you send it out into the world, and then the world judges it. And there's been situations where I have been working on a project, and I've gone, "There is no way this is going to work. There is absolutely no way this is going to work. It's a terrible idea, guys. I hate it." And it comes out, and the world loves it. And I've had some embarrassing, shocking moments with that sort of stuff. Um, so sometimes it's important to, to know that you can't always pick trends and stuff as well, and what's going to work as well. Remaining open is probably a, a good thing to throw into that, I guess, at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Listening to others, being able to take it on board, and interpretation. Your job probably is interpretation quite a lot of the time. is like Because I used to be um, a printer when I was like – trying to make it in music, whatever that means. I had a day job. My day job was printing. And I remember we would get people coming in and we would do some graphic design, you know, for the front cover. And we'd, we'd, we'd do, uh, you know, do a, a test run. And the, the art, it wasn't even the artist. The, the, the client itself would come in and go, yeah, I don't like that blue. And you'd be like, well, okay, you know, how would you like the blue to be on the front cover? And they'd say... I need it to be more sky blue. Now, mm. there's many smart Alec ways you can answer that because honestly, I'm looking out here. I'm in Nashville. It's, clo it's <laughs> five past five. It's a little cloudy. And the sky blue is kind of grayish blue. Now, at 12, right. it was much brighter. And also, if I was in a different hemisphere, it would be a different color altogether. And so the point is, is like, how do you answer that question? Do you go... Well, you know, where, which part of the world are we in? What time of day it is? There's so many, there's so many passive aggressive ways, you know, to, to push that back. But ultimately, when people say sky blue, cutting through the crap, they probably mean sitting on the beach, this beautiful, bright, because that's the sort of ultimate bright blue. So for you, oh, when somebody sure. says, I'm trying to give a musical reference, you know, I want the drums to be bigger, that could be. <laughs> more modern. That's the one we yeah. always get. Make it more yes, modern. More modern. So you, modern probably, huh, interesting. What would modern mean to me? Modern would to me might be a little bit more, probably not modern, but a little bit, because modern, if you take it literally, would be like what's exactly on the radio at the moment. And it's unlikely that a client I'm talking to actually knows what's going on currently. It's very unlikely. What they probably mean is what they think is modern, which means a little bit less organic, a little yeah, bit more yeah. chopped up sounding. Because modern, actually, currently on the radio might be Adele. Sure, could be sure, throw sure. Could 50s, <laughs> 60s, Motown stack sounding. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what's most successful. So if you want it to be modern, do you mean current Taylor Swift or current Adele? Those are like the big things that, are, that people are trying to right. sound like at the moment. Um, what they probably mean for you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is they probably mean a little bit, a little less organic, a little bit more chopped up, a little bit more, because if you look at a guy and he's 55 years old, to him, that's modern. Right. So it's all about <laughs> well, I mean, it depends. It depends on where they kind of are with their own listening exactly. habits and things. I've had people that feel that modern means adding a drum kit, um, wow. you know, under under some strings, for example. I mean, it can be that, yeah. right? Um, I've had some that are like make it something like I've I've never heard before. Just go go completely weird, and I just I want to hear it, and I don't want to be able to go. I've heard that in this song, so, so for this example. Is a, and that's that's a, that's a challenge. Yeah. So your job there is understanding your client or your clients, yes. multiple multiple clients yes um and yeah. sort of like getting into their heads a little bit um i find and this is a sort of a, a tip from a production point of view is it's about presentation so what right. when i say something for me and i, I hate if an artist is going to watch this because if an artist watches they're going to see my, some of my give away some of my tricks um when i'm talking to an artist and i'm trying to get them to come up be a little bit more pop 
And when I mean by pop, I mean more accessible. Something that isn't quite so left of center that nobody's going to like it. I use The Cure. Because The Cure, can you think of any, I mean, The Cure are like Joy Division. They're like one of the coolest bands that ever lived. Mm, but mm. Robert Smith wrote, bump, 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 but don't bump, bump, you know. Right. You know, love cats. <laughs> I mean, you don't get, or even, you know, even The Forest. You know, Forest is one of my favorite, favorite ever songs. I saw Cure, The Cure about a month ago, three weeks ago now in, at the Hollywood Bowl. And I cried wow. through half of that show. My wife yeah, said, what's yeah, going yeah. on? I'm like, this is my childhood. And the forest is like, run away, run away. And like, it's just the most simple but hooky bass line ever. So when I talk to an artist, I, I can evoke well, let's make it a little bit more. You know, what about that cure feel? And you, you can bring in a, a groove, which is so that if I played that groove without that reference, they're going to be like, oh, that's kind of pop. You know, burn up, burn up, right. burn up. But if, right. I, if I present it in a way and say, yeah, it's kind of like a cure thing, or this is like a Joy Division bass line, it gets them all excited because yeah. they, they latch on to the indie credibility and stuff like that. So your job, I imagine you can correct me if I'm wrong. Is probably like that on steroids. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it depends too. Of course, everybody you work with is going to be different, sure. and at the end of the day, your job is to work with them and produce a soundtrack for the game that's going to come out. Everybody enjoys and hits all those emotional responses yeah. and stuff. If within that, if we can shoehorn some some breaking of boundaries and things like that, I'm always for that. And I love that sort of stuff. Um, just to add to one of your points there too, I was working with an audio director recently who said, uh, we don't want it modern. We don't want you to follow trends. They wanted a, a more synthesizer based thing. And of course, when everybody says synthesizers and modern, they think of certain sounds, right? And, and he said something really interesting to me, which is we don't want it to be like that because we don't want to date the game. So if you follow whatever trend is happening right at the moment, people will go, ah, that's 2016 right there. And whenever you're playing something in the 90s, especially video games, a lot of the time it's the boom, boom, kaka, the boom, 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 kaka. It's like a, a big beat sort of prodigy, uh, fat boy slim inspired thing, right? That was the sound of the video games in the late 90s, for example. And when you're following that trend, it really does date the game. It puts it in a time period. Whereas when we look back at sort of great media art, other than the actual medium that it might have been illustrated on at the time, whether early film stock or early, early video game technology or something like whatever it might have been, early recording technology, sometimes on some tracks, that's the only thing that's restricting it from being within that time period. You know, yeah. you brought up some of the um, Matt stuff from, from uh, ACDC and things like that. There's a lot of people that have a lot of difficulty dating certain AD ACDC tracks. They've kind of always existed within their own space. Yeah. Um, you could put some of U2 stuff in that same sort of category. You could put some of, uh, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers stuff in that same sort of category as well, right? And uh, it was such an interesting philosophy. It certainly had me thinking for sure. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. So I think what I was touching on was the sort of the psychology of communicating. You know, right. that sort of ability to present it in a way, because another one for me with singer-songwriters is to, is to name-check Bob Dylan. Because, right. you know, two of my favorite songs and probably anybody that loves music is like, It Ain't Me, Babe, or Just Like a Woman. Both of which are like three-minute mm. pop songs. You know, go away from my window. It ain't me, babe. No, 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 it ain't me, babe. It ain't me you're looking for, babe. I mean, that is a perfect pop song. You could, totally, I could give it totally. to you. You could produce it in a modern, you know, in a modern way. And it could right. be a top 10 single for pretty much anybody on the planet. It is a great, great song. Mm. And I think that, Sometimes it's just allowing the artist or the people you're working with to, to understand that just being hooky maybe is not a bad thing in presentation because there's a negative connotation sometimes with, with things that are quote-unquote pop. And my father always used to say, because my father only listens to classical and jazz and mainly classical and some of the craziest classical, he used to say to me, he goes, pop means popular. And when I was a little kid in England, um, Hulse, The Planets was huge. It actually oh, yeah, was like cool. a number one album when I was little in the oh. 70s and 80s. It was hugely successful. Yeah, yeah. And my dad said to me, well, what's pop music? Hulse? Is Hulse popular? 
you know, ba da ba ba da da ba ba da ba ba da da ba ba. I mean, what a melody! I mean, mm, absolutely. You know, how much is the? How many records has Beethoven fifth or ninth sold? Those huge melodies yeah. over the years. I'm sure that. Yeah, I'll listen to Ode to Joy. Yeah. Ode to Joy is like the perfect pop yeah, song. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so there we are. We've got like some probably you know between Previn and everybody else's versions of those. It probably adds up to multiple millions of sales. Uh, Alfred mm, Brendel mm. probably has sold a few million albums. And I mm, immediately thought mm. of Brendel when you were talking about orchestras because, you know, when he, when he plays Beethoven with complete rubato, if you watch as well as listen to those performances, it's insane. I, 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 I hope that anybody who gets this far through our interview goes and goes and looks up Alfred Brendel on YouTube and watches like Vienna, the Vienna Symphony Orchestra or whatever it's called, playing with him. It is unbelievable mm. that what the conductor's doing, catching all of his rubato and everybody. I mean, it is the ultimate in, as you were saying, tight totally, totally, musicianship. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, totally, like even within all that, while all that is really, really valuable lessons and stuff like that, um, you know, it is important to acknowledge the kind of cool stuff that you can do these days that couldn't have been done previously as yeah. well, right? I have this really good buddy of mine and he does big big, big electronic music shows. He headlines these massive shows, right? And the way he thinks about writing his music is solely for that massive crowd, loud experience. So what I mean by that is he has a 250,000 watt PA system that he tours wow. with. This thing is huge. It is a physical experience. He writes his music picking the key of the song so it resonates the subwoofers, subwoofers not too low, but low enough just so stuff vibrates. So that's 37 to 45 hertz, right? Yeah. That's the key of the song where he's picking there. He picks the tempo of the song to allow the kick drum to hit, push that 100 hertz into the audience, relax a little bit, subwoofer kicks in with a bass note, and then the kick drum hits again. He picks the tempo of the song for that. He creates the emotional sort of arc of the song to give people an instant recognition of oh, this is the song. Then there's 16 to whatever, 32 bars of the build up, so they know exactly what's going to happen next, right? Then that big stuff kicks in and everybody goes crazy for 32 bars. Then there's a breakdown where everybody gets a chance to relax, have a look around a bit, check Twitter, whatever they do in the crowd, right? And then jump back straight in again. Now he's able to do that now in 2016 and would never have been able to do that previously. And that's a kind of cool way to see how music is touching people these days on mass with that sort of loud experience as well that's wonderful you touched on so much stuff that 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 um the technology allows us to do because even on, on what i do in mixing the fact that i can go in there and i can automate all of the eqs for different sections of the song like the density now comes in now obviously in ssls for years you could you could have the vocal maybe coming out two or three channels so you could switch between channels mute that one unmute this one you know, you could parallel this, that, and the other. But now I can do it on multiple levels. I can have my vocal totally. be brighter in the choruses so it feels like it's in the same register at all times. It doesn't disappear because <laughs> the electric guitars come in and kill the top end on the vocal. I mean, it's beautiful yeah. we can do it. <laughs> and I mean, that singer has recorded this line in Tokyo and then this line was done in yeah. Sydney and then this line was done in a hotel yeah. room in San Francisco. And that's all strung together to make a single song as well. I mean, it's crazy what you can do these it days. It is. And like, you know, I love microphones. I love gear. But, you know, I have done records where people, have, like you just said, have sent me something. We, we did a um, Chris Allen. He was he'd won American Idol a few years ago. And um, Joe King from The Fray had written the song and had sung all the backgrounds into his laptop with a pair of earbuds in a, sorry, in an airport. And all oh, of wow. it was like, yeah, yeah. He had multi, he had done like four or five of those and then did a harmony over the top of it. And we got into the studio with Chris and we re-sang all the backgrounds, pulled it up, was like, it's really well recorded, U47, you know, we were in Sunset Sound, we had this compressor and that and blah, 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 and the room and this and that. And then we played the two track and we're like, sounds better there's something about this <laughs> crappy little i mean at the moment i'm talking yeah. into whatever this mic somewhere on the right. stick, you know and it, right. it sounded better it was grainier whatever it was i have no idea and i don't want to even begin to understand but it fit in the track better 
So I texted Joe, like, Joe, can you send me? And he did. He just sent me the two track stereo <laughs> file of him singing <laughs> into his laptop. We put it into the. I song. mean, that's crazy. There's all sorts of like funky multi band compressors that like duck your voice when you're singing into it. There's so much going on there. That's crazy. But maybe that's the strength of the musical idea it is, too, right? Exactly. The idea trumps, you know, and I, I, I say this all the time, but yeah, creativity is king. I mean, the, the you know, talking of. Uh, um, a New Zealand artist, um, obviously, um, Lord. I mean, that was like, I, you know, I say this all the time. I, 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 I'm not taking anything away from the guy that produced the track, but really, it's a beat. It's a beat, and I think the sub <laughs> comes in once or something like that. It's all right, right. about that lyric and that melody, you know? It's like the lyric is amazing. You know, you, you and I having knowing about royal families and stuff, you know, um, you know, it was a great subject. You know, we could be royals, yes. you know, just for one. It's just like, yeah. it's such a great idea. Yeah. You know, maybe it may be the skill of that engineer, right, is the confidence in knowing that that's all it Absolutely. needed. Yeah. No, I'm not going to go record 60-piece string orchestra and a choir yeah. that goes behind it and an old organ from some old church and then layer all sorts of dubstep synths in it or whatever, right? It's the confidence to know that that's just it. Um Rick Rubin, Johnny Cash, that that just acoustic guitar and big voice is all it needed, right? And a piano in yeah. bits. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of Rick's strengths and weaknesses is the same thing. He 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 right. doesn't get in there and get stuck in and pull things apart that much. He keeps it very simple, and when it works, it works really really well because he makes it about the song. Uh, my friend mm -hmm. Greg was mixing a. I think it was an Anthrax record or a Pant. I'm blanking. Anyway, mixing a record that um, that uh, that Rick had produced, and he and Rick comes down into the studio, and Greg was checking the phase on the guitars because he had stereo guitars panned, and he just wanted to make sure that, that there wasn't any issues, so it felt wide. So he, he he puts it into mono so that so everything's over the top of each other, and Rick goes, "What did you just do?" And he goes, "I'm just checking the phase." He goes, "That's it." He's like, what do you mean? He goes, oh, wow. that's it. That's the sound of this record. <laughs> so the record's in mono. But, there's, but wow. there's a certain sound because it's just like in your face the whole time. There's no, there's no escaping it. So, it, so the, I don't know if it was the whole album or the sound of that song or several songs, but it's in mono. Uh, I'm sure mm -hmm. people can leave subscribe below, <laughs> the subscribers below who can let us know what it was. I don't remember <laughs> if it was Anthrax or Pantera. Actually, it might have been Sepultura, but it was one of those bands, those in-your-face kind of rock bands. And it went to mono mm. because that was the emotion that fit that song. And Which wow. is also interesting because there's a lot of... I don't want to purvey... You know, I'm a musician, you're a musician. I, I, I still play guitar every day, so you know, I believe I personally come from a musical background, and I bring that to it. But I think there's also something to be said for, for producers and people that make music that aren't necessarily musical... They can still have that end user ear. A lot of the greatest producers weren't really musicians. They just knew when something felt right. And mm -hmm. you're dealing with people mm -hmm. all day that aren't musicians. You know. Right. <laughs> but same again, I mean, what they are experts at is making video yeah. games. And you know when it's working. Yeah. And, I mean, some of these people, I worked with a creative director a couple of years ago, and we sat down in a room, and it was for a first-person shooter video game, right? Yep. And at that point, the game didn't really exist. It kind of existed on paper, but we weren't really sure how it was going to work. And I asked this creative director, so at this point here in level seven where we've just, I don't know, shot a bunch of dudes over here, whatever, whatever it might have been, what happens next? And he kind of sits and he looks at me and he looks at the desk and then he stands up, he turns to the left and then he walks two steps right. And then he turns back and faces me and he puts his hand up and he grabs something imaginary out of the sky. And he turns two steps back to the right and walks back down this way to the end of the hallway. And I didn't, it took me a couple of minutes to figure out what the hell he was doing, but then it all dawned on me. He already had the whole game in his mind. He was able to visualize exactly where this object was in the 3D space, exactly where this door was in the 3D space, exactly how long this corridor was in the 3D space. So when you're working with geniuses on this level, it really puts that musical knowledge, whatever I might have, really kind of, you know, on such a different, different level, right? So, um, yeah, and they, they always know when it works, those sort of uh, creative directors for sure. That's amazing. No, I love that. I, I, when I'm starting to produce a track with a band, I don't want to start the track until I know what the finished result's going to sound like in my mind. 
I'm not one of those explore mm. it as you go kind of guys. Oh, we'll just keep tracking until it feels good. Right. Um, which is interesting because a lot of artists will be like, oh, I think we should. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to be condescending. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, don't worry. I've already played out all of those scenarios. <laughs> right. I've already done that one. Yeah. Dude. You know, yeah. you already played the scenario out in your mind about how it's going to work. Right. But I feel like you need, you know, and I, I've, I've said this a lot and I'm, I, I wonder for you, you, you have to be resolute. Can't be wishy-washy. Can't be like, I don't know, we'll just figure it out. You know, it's, you've right, got to right, go right, into right. it. <laughs> I mean, it depends sometimes, like, especially when they're like, oh, I need some sounds that I haven't heard sure. before. To approach something like that, you, you can daydream as much as you like, you know, but in, honestly, until you kind of sit down and start playing with sounds, you can see kind of what's possible within that space. Um, that being said, though, the majority of the time, I don't even like to approach the computer until I know what I'm going to do. It is an intentional decision when I approach the computer to make something. It is not, ah, oh, we'll just throw it up in some plugins and there's some synths and whatever, I'll go to my same C, G, A minor, F, whatever. Um, no, you need to kind of have that intention in mind. You go to that computer to put that note down. You go to that computer to, to mix that, to boost that frequency, whatever. You kind of have that intentional process. Whether it works or not afterwards is kind of, you know, part of the process as well but you certainly have to have that in mind to begin with yeah that that may lead to another idea even if it's not the final result exactly. plus i imagine exactly. um and this is probably very important that that confidence in doing it is is an, a massive part because you've got to have a creative director feel like you are confident in what you do the last thing you want to be doing is sitting in right. a meeting going you know go back and try <laughs> try, try some stuff and see whether you like it they're going to be like ah, i'm right. not sure about this guy yeah it is literally sometimes the scariest thing to walk into a boardroom and there is 30 people sitting around this really long table that goes as far as the horizon. <laughs> and usually there's several teleconference machines that are on the table with people that are all in other parts of the world. And they sit down and they say, so what, have you, uh, what sort of ideas do you have? And that might be the initial meeting, you know. And sometimes it can be really scary. You'll go, oh, you know what, we'll do this and this and this and this and this. That'll be great. And they'll go, yeah, cool, sounds awesome. And then you walk out of that, man, that meeting going, holy crap, how am I going to make that work? You know, <laughs> how do I a bunch kind of, of crazy illustrate ideas? Now, how am I going to make that actually work? Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. But sometimes that's cool as well. Sometimes you can say, "I'm going to create a acoustic record only using a ukulele with one string and a Piezo microphone." Yeah. Right? You'll come up with something you with that creative restriction, and that's kind of important as well. I just you make, you make me think. So I just the other day um, I was demoing a mic that is uh it's made by this company called lewitt and it's uh it's just one capsule but they figured out how to record both sides of it so essentially you've got the world's greatest stereo mic because instead of having two capsules that are close to each other and, and they've got some kind of coincidence this is just one capsule so they're recording front and back so what i did is i stuck it over a drum kit like this so it was facing this way and the drum kit's here right and we came back in the room and listened to it with the drummer and the drummer's like that's the best recording of my drum kit ever because there's no wow. phase. When it goes around the kit, sure. it's like perfect. It's like this perfect wow. stereo imagery. And so we were like sure. all obsessing going, wouldn't it be amazing to make a record with just that one mic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like suddenly you're restricted, but like every instrument is just like going to have its perfect stereo imagery and everything. Oh. So, but, you know, you need to find that artist or that project that will allow you to do that. Right, exactly, exactly. So for exactly, you sometimes... Exactly. Can be quite exciting because the all bets are off. You can probably do that and be like, for your own edification, your own excitement, like, oh, I'm going to try and just do this. I'm going to try and use this synth, and I'm going to try. It's pretty right. exciting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what's really, really cool about making music for, for, well, for any sort of, I guess, media sort of process, especially video games, is that every single process is different. Every single uh, project is different. So I went from doing a very specific genre, 60s inspired project, to a very cutting edge modern fighting game, which had very, all sorts of different types of music, whether it was pop music or hip hop or big orchestral stuff or all sorts of things. Then on to, you know, a big sort of industrial heavy nine string guitars, big synthesizer sort of project as well. And this was all in the, spirit, the period of about 18 months of each other, you know. Uh, next thing is like a kind of 80s synthwave thing with Western guitars in it. Then one thing after that is going to be more 60s stuff. So there's stuff that you're kind of moving around with all the time. 
um, which is really, really cool. And I think it's important. It's good in those sort of situations because you're absorbing so much. And each time you go through one of those things, you learn so many different lessons and you take those lessons onto other projects and things as such as well. Um, but yeah, certainly we will do sit down. Um, there was a project I had a couple of years ago where there was a really horrible scene, really, really Nazi, uh, a nasty scene with, with a Nazi general who was cutting up your friends with scalpels and all the video games, yeah. right? So always this sort of stuff. Um, but we kind of sat around and we said, well, what do we do in this situation? How do we put music to this? And came up with this idea of using just distortion. Now, I don't mean a guitar with distortion on it. I don't mean a drum kit with distortion on it. I mean, don't mean violins with distortion on it. No, I mean just distortion circuits. Right. So we ran all sorts of tube circuits and, and uh, all sorts of different, different, you know, huge amounts of gain pulsing through different things and automating, just grabbing different knobs and things and stuff like that. Um, different feedback circuits and stuff like that, whatever we could, right, to create this really horrible distorted texture. And then throwing that into the game um, worked. And it worked too well. It just made it even more horrible. <laughs> I guess that's kind of the thing to say. <laughs> but certainly sitting down and going, I'm going to make a song just out of distortion, just out of distortion is, is a pretty cool song. Sort of, uh, you can do those things in video games for sure. How, uh, how much, like, okay, uh, and this is probably not a straight answer. And I'm going to ask to, to to generalize, but which I'm sure you don't want to do. But how much, on average, amount of music, original in time, original music you have to come up with with a game? And I'm sure there's no single answer, but. No, honestly, it's pretty pretty straightforward. Standard sort of first person shooter experience. I usually look at doing about four hours of music. Wow. Sometimes it can be five hours of music, sometimes it can be less. Um, sometimes it can be half an hour of music. It really just depends on the game, of course. But generally, I like to hit that sort of four hour, five hour experience. I like wow. to have the player listening to new music about every 15, 10 to 15 minutes. So if they're playing that one level and that level is an hour and it's taken them an hour to get through it and that same song is yeah. playing over and over again, either it's going to be a really, really, really yeah. good song or a variation is the key. Variation is the cheat way of doing it. So four to five. Um, so yeah, about, about four hours. Yeah. Mm. No, I didn't know. I, thank mm. you for answering that so succinctly. Um, that's amazing. So you're like doing, bearing in mind a album it's a little longer these days it used to be 40 minutes 20 minutes aside sure. but we're probably closer to an hour so you're you're basically coming up with a, a a four to five album each game yeah now that being said though some you know minute of music right if we take a minute of music 60 seconds of music sometimes a 60 second piece of music can take infinite amount of time it can take seven years to write a melody right sometimes right who knows if you really want a good 60 minutes of music if it's really complex and there's a lot of different parts that need to kind of move and work in with each other if there's no repeating if it's more of a classically inspired thing and you're using melody to tell a story that doesn't repeat then it's going to be a lot more complicated so that can take a long time sometimes a minute of music takes a minute to write mix produce deliver it really is quite quite simple so it's kind of it's difficult to quantify at times so it's not always like a full album that's for sure yeah but i think that's a but i think that is a great album a great album has those kind of elements you know if we right. think of like and great albums is a you know everybody's gonna have their own idea of great album but a uh a, you know if you take like the the great pieces of production and again Going back to Lord, great production can sometimes be acoustic guitar vocal, but involved production, say, of like a Queen or an ELO album or something that was, or a Beatles album, a later period Beatles album, like an Abbey Road or, you know, or even a Y album, they, they have so much light and shade. And some of the stuff on the Y album is, you know, Rocky Raccoon, pretty simple. Um, you know, right. um, Glass Onion is somewhere in the middle. You know, there's all these different things. And then you go to Abbey Road and you've got like, you know, you've got medleys of songs. and then it, So I think even in great music, we have exactly what you're talking about. Simple pieces that probably were written, recorded mm. in a half an hour. And then other stuff that may have taken them weeks to do. So, mm. yeah, it sounds like you're doing like four albums worth of music every time you have to. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it depends too. Like, you'll have to help me here, Warren, because I cannot, who, cannot remember who, who, who did this quote, who, who said this quote. But I think it's such a fascinating quote. You'll be able to tell me who it is and smack me Hopefully. down. but. Somebody said once upon a time, which I think is really important, that your chorus needs to be a chorus. Sure. Your verse needs to be a chorus. Your bridge needs to be a chorus. Your intro needs to be a chorus. Every single element of the song needs to be 
memorable. It needs to have something special and bring something new. And I guess that's a super important thing to bring in whatever you're doing, especially video game music, because we're talking about variation and things. But it's such a good philosophy when you're approaching music as well. I don't well. know who said that, but I, lo- I love that quote. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. You think of, um, um, God, what's the song? I'm looking around for a guitar so I can play this song <laughs> to remember it. Um, Visualize. Um, uh, your baby's good to me, you know, she's happy, you know, she said so, I'm in love with her and I feel, I'm so glad that she's my little girl, which is the, what is the chorus in that song, you know? Um, right, right. It's, uh, um, the, the riff is, is super hooky, the, um, the guitar yeah. riff is hooky, the pre-chorus is, could be the chorus or is it the bridge? The verse, is that the chorus? I mean, a, a it's not every Beatles song, but a lot of Beatles songs are just like, like you said, they're chorus after chorus after chorus. Beatles are a textbook in that stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And the uh, mm-hmm. the quote that I keep stealing and using a lot is Quincy Jones. Was th- uh, Tommy Vicari told me this, who's, who's a longtime friend of Quincy's and has engineered uh, many albums that Quincy's uh, produced. And he said the three most important things in music are the song, the song, and the song. <laughs> yeah totally totally, so totally. I, you know having said that i also love with all of our discussion elvis costello's quote which he isn't his but he uses and come from somebody is that talking about music is like dancing about architecture um, right and sure. i think that sometimes I, I i find myself saying that or thinking that when i'm I'm, I'm, we, we're not doing it because we're not debating. But, you know, sometimes when you, you're talking to the client, whether it be the artist or, in your case, the creative director, sometimes I feel like that's coming to my mind because I feel like probably sometimes the best way to communicate with somebody is to actually come up with some music and play it and then mm. see their response. Sometimes do you, totally. do you find yourself sometimes you have to do that just to break the ice to find out. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Sometimes, you know, it's weird, like guitar players, right? We're both guitar players. So let's use that as an analogy. So many times, like certainly lately, guitar has gotten a real bad rap. It's got a bad reputation. I don't know why. I don't know where this is coming out. I I guess it's probably because of the whole 80s guitar thing, but, or metal thing or whatever. Somebody, but anyway, certainly sometimes I can be discussing with somebody and I'll mention guitar and you can instantly see um, what would be equivalently called kind of a musical prejudice kicking in the brain. And, and they associate guitar with some sort of negativity, whatever it might be, I don't know. Um, and straight away they're like, no, 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 no guitar whatsoever. No, I don't want that. And it's really not until you try it, you really just don't know. There might be a new way to do the guitar. We might be able to figure out some way. Even if we approach the guitar with that in mind, let's do guitar, but do it in a way that doesn't sound like guitar. Sure. You know? I would imagine that's how Sean Bevan and those guys would have come across that Antichrist Superstar guitar tone we were talking about before. They would have said, We've got guitars, but we want to do them in a new yep. way, right? So prejudices, musical prejudices, is a difficult thing to get around. But then I guess that's the danger of the kind of world we live in, too, with labels as a whole. Certain, you know, whether you're labeling guitar as a certain thing or whether you're labeling a certain genre, people will say sometimes, oh, I love all music except country music. I'm like, well, you, maybe you just haven't found the sort of type of country music that you yep. like, you know? Um, just to throw that sort of label and have a prejudice against a label and then throw out everything that associates with that label is so dangerous to the creative mind. It certainly is. And you're hitting the nail on the head, really. It's, it's interesting because I, um, I wrote a blues rock song with an artist recently, which is what they wanted. I sent it to the label and they, they're like, oh, I love the song. It's great. But can you produce it so it sounds less country? And I like country and I produce country, but I'm thinking to myself... <laughs> You know, I, I know the song and the genre and, and that I used to model this on, and it is a blues song. And if you close your eyes, right. you're pretty close. And But that person's idea, it was just a period where, because now country, if you talk about country, now country's like, uh, it, uh, here I am in Nashville, and it's uh, what's very popular at the moment is this sort of bro country, which is essentially like Nickelback. <laughs> it sounds like Nickelback from 10 years oh, ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Super sure. heavy rock. But with a guy singing with a yowls and and all, but singing with a twang over it. But if you mute the vocal, it could be a Nickelback song. And it's yeah, just, sure. That's, and there's nothing wrong with that or right with that. It's just it is what it is. It's like if you like it and that's what you like, that that's what it's doing at the moment. But then there's also the East Nashville country scene, which is a kind of Lumineers 
or um, you know, my friend Dave Cobb is you know Chris Stapleton just won Grammys with Chris Stapleton, right. which is um, the sort of non-production production where you, the artist goes in the room, you throw up a pair of microphones, you get the balances right, and you go boom, let's make a record, and in a day they make an album. Yeah, sure. And the production is yeah. pretty much not producing it, just capturing really incredible performances. So, what is country? Is it that? Yeah, you know, sure. I know you were just using country for instance, but I think that that's yes, you're exactly right. I'm just I'm just completely agreeing with you because one person's country could it be Nickelback? Is mm, it mm. super organic, which is the same as jazz? The way jazz was recorded, the best jazz was recorded right, with, like right. you said, an RCA 44 in a room. And a quintet right, right. surrounding one microphone. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's all about seeing, um, trying to understand the artist, or in your case, the creative director, you know, through their vision of, yeah, it's... A, <laughs> it's sometimes interesting, though, too, because, you know, I have that little rascal kind of Australian thing in me, I guess, <laughs> when they say, don't use synthesizers, my go, well, okay, I'm going to make this song entirely out of synthesizers in a way that you're not going to be able to tell that they're synthesizers, and then we'll see if we can sneak that by you, and stuff like that. So sometimes, I don't know, it can be kind of larrickanism and things as well, I yeah, guess. Yeah, a little, a little punk um, rock attitude is, is good in anything. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's so punk rock, but it's maybe. punk rock. <laughs> It's punk rock in right. attitude. I think. I think um, it's an overused word, word where I live in in Hollywood. You know, in, in Los Angeles, it's, a, it's an overused thing. But it's the truth. It's that edge, and it's like we were talking about with sure. like Green Day, Green, Sound of a Green Day record also being in a Jewel record, even though Jewel's folky rock at that period, folky pop even, and Green Day supposedly Buzzcocks kind of sounding punk rock. But that same edge right. was carried through by the mixer of both songs. And I, it's an overused word, edge, but um, but it's 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 very prevalent because I think that when I listen to John Coltrane, good John Coltrane is dangerous in just the same way that the Sex Pistols are dangerous. I really do think that. Mm. I think it emotes the same thing because Coltrane was like a poor black guy playing music to to live and survive because he that's all he knew. So to me. That is mm. the same aesthetic as a band living down the street here in Nashville, five of them in a, in a cheap rented house creating music. To me, what's the difference? You know, Coltrane mm. lived at a time where being black in America was not, was not a great thing. You know, you, you had to strive. Mm. You couldn't go to certain bars. You couldn't do this. To me, it's the same aesthetic. And I think that you, you hit the nail on the head much, much earlier when you were talking about finding that, we're talking about finding that common ground. You know, and I think mm. it seems like one thing that's good, good for all of us is to be a, an encyclopedia of music. Right. Uh, sure. For you, that yeah. I love music. I, I think we've all got to love music for the notes on the page yep. and how it makes you feel. Yep. And approaching things with an open mind is the most important thing. Really, I mean, you only live once. If you're going to lock yourself off from an entire genre or an entire instrument just because, I don't know, your own prejudices in some way, you're losing out. You're only damaging yourself by doing sure. that. So love it for the notes on the page. Love it for the way it makes you feel regardless of what other people think. Well, plus, you just said you worked on a game one, one, one year, month or whatever that was a 60s influence. And then you're off doing right. like more an 8-bit sounding, you know, kind of synthy thing. And you're hitting the nail on the head. If you want to be successful and you want to have a career in the music industry, whether it be video games or doing what I do, you've got to be able to adapt. I mean, I got... Right, and it comes back to what we were saying before about music being the thing that you do. Yeah. It is your lifestyle. It is what you think about all yeah. day. I'm sure you're the same when I'm not standing in front of the computer working away. I'm reading sound on sound. I'm watching Produce Like a Pro. I'm you know, reading up on new plugins, new techniques, new interviews that I've found. When we go for walks and things, my head's going tick, 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 tick. Oh, wasn't that interesting? That car drove past there and it created a resonance on the, the wooden building over there. That, that's kind of fascinating. I wonder if I can use that in some weird way. There's a bird over there that's singing something quite fascinating the tones of that bird are like almost pure sine waves and somehow it's able to amplify that in through its tiny little body i wonder what we can use with that i had a buddy recently this is so freaky right but for some reason hear me out on this oh, one but he collects bear with me he collects bear with me it's kind of weird human skulls oh because they have different resonant frequencies 
And it was like, no, 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 he's an artist. He just loves the look of him. But like my, <laughs> the human moral side of me is like, that's horrible. Somebody has like spoken through yeah. that. They've eaten through that. That's been a face, you know, somebody yeah. known that. Do you even know anything about that? But then the audio side of me is like, the human head is the most amazing resonance yeah. chamber that <laughs> exists on yeah. earth. That's kind of cool. So, you know, it's, it's music is definitely the thing you do for sure. Yeah, I love, I love what you're saying because I, the thing about being a guitar player, the thing about us as a guitar player, I don't know if you found this, as you, especially as you got into keys and programming and stuff like that. We're kind of a little, we, 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 keyboard players have it so much better than we do when you first start because they're, especially in this modern age where I'm, I'm looking over here as a Nord to my right. Now, unless you deliberately detune this Nord, it's in concert. So when you start playing mm. keys these days, you are training yourself to understand harmony and melody. You're blessed. Now with us... And obviously now you can buy a, a tuner, a headstock tuner, but the thing about string right. instruments is they're never quite perfect. So I, mm, mm, I mm. had to literally force myself to do ear training exercises to because I wanted to be able to, because I, I was in bands at 16 years old and the piano player was 16 years old as well. And he's all like, he's like picking up the song in a nanosecond. And I'm like, what? And I realized he's been playing <laughs> for 10 years and he just hears harmony and melody so much quicker than us guitar players do because mm. we're listening to Zeppelin, which is kind of in E. <laughs> you know, sort of in E. <laughs> right. Or The Who, which was sort of E flatish. You know, all these different songs. Right. And, because some, we're all just, they were all just tuning off each other. So our ears are hearing yeah. all of these versions of concert pitch. And I realized that if I want to be a musician, and this is, you know, you don't have to be this, but for me, the, the conversation you just had where you were just talking, the, the, the thing you were just talking about, I, I do the same thing. I'll hear like, an oh, no, over there, something humming, and I want to know what it is. And I just, I, I have to hear. I want to know, oh, was that an A? Oh, you know, I, 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 right. <laughs> I, 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 I want to know. And when I, exactly the same way, if I hear a car, car horn go, meh, I want to be like, meh, I want to know what that is. And it makes me think of this and, mm -hmm. oh, it's it's so exciting as you as we get mm -hmm. older and we experience more and we develop great ears, you know, because it takes time. I don't believe that people mm. are. I don't want to have a discussion because some people will tell me I'm wrong, but I don't believe it's just born innate. You know, we train ourselves and we develop our ears, but the better they get, it's so exciting. It's great to listen mm. to music and to hear things, and for me to go back to music that I grew up on and now understand it even better and better as as I as I grow older and develop more. Oh, it's so beautiful. I mean, we're blessed. Mm -hmm. We're blessed to be able absolutely, to do this. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, remaining open yeah. too and seeing where those ideas can take things too. Um, once I was working on a, I don't know, a, a situation in a game that had all sorts of like, uh, like futuristic technology. Um, and, and it was kind of like, you know, like a, a kryptonite sort of stuff. You imagine Superman. Yep. So there's all sorts of like... Uh, it wasn't Superman, but there's all sorts of crystals and stuff like that. And of course, like a lot of people think, well, bells and, you know, glassy type textures and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of cool. Anyway, I went for a walk and, um, and, and heard some wind chimes off in the distance, right? And I was like, oh, wind chimes, that's kind of interesting, right? That's an interesting concept. Where can we explore that? So instead of coming back and going, oh, I'll just record some wind chimes, I said, well, let's take it further. What are wind chimes, right? They're resonant chambers. What can we do with resonance? So I gathered a whole bunch of different metallic objects. So these would be saucepans or trays that were made out of aluminium or, you know, different bits that I'd find off the street or wind chimes and things as well. And I hung all these in, in, in a live room, right? And then I pumped... Sorry, but before I did that, what I did is connected contact microphones to each one of these little resonant pieces of metal that were hanging from the ceiling. Then I set up an array of speakers around the room and pumped sine waves at different pitches and things wow. through the room. Now, what that did was resonate the pieces of metal at their certain natural bits of, of whatever it might have been, a natural resonant spot, right, to pick up their own harmonics. And the contact mics were picking that up. But what I ended up with was this really crazy futuristic resonant sound that was inspired by what I'd seen on a walk about wind, wind chimes and things, only because they'd remained open throughout that whole process. And I didn't go, okay, it's, there's crystals and stuff, so let's do bells, right? And I think we get better at that as we get older too. We kind of look beyond what the, what the obvious might be. It's awesome. This reminds me of, of, of being a kid and reading like how Depeche Mode made a record. Ah, yeah. They would wow, do yeah. things, they would like take glass and smash it so and then slow it down 
So it'd be yeah, like, yeah. and that would be like, oh, that's our kick drum. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, just like completely yeah, out of the box thinking and yeah. early synthesized, uh, sorry, early samplers and, and the fact that there was a degradation, a de degradation in the sound when it slowed down or when it sped up. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the bit depth mm. affecting stuff. And oh, I love it. No, that's. It's, I mean, that's a sound. That's a sound we haven't been able to replicate too. Sure, there's bit crushes and stuff like that. No, no worries about that. But that, like, old, you know, SP twelve hundred, you know, it's, you record it at concert pitch and then pitch it down. That sort of graininess that we come through. That I haven't found plugins that do a good job of that stuff, do, man. Do you buy some cool do you things get, like old samplers? Do you buy them and try that kind of stuff? I don't have an old sampler. That's the only thing I don't have in the collection. But I'm, I'm huge into synths at the moment. I, uh, one of my new ones is a, uh, a Polovox from Soviet uh, Russia in 1982 was built. What's that and, called? Uh, and I found a guy in Ukraine. Polyvox. Polyvox. Yeah, Polyvox, because there was two voices, a noise if you count yeah. that. But um, yeah, so I love this thing, right? Because it's, uh, it's, it's Soviet, so it's huge and it's heavy, so it's, it's really over-engineered. When it arrived, it's uh, reed switches, so the keys, uh, so like magnet switches yep. basically. And it's a few that the magnets had become kind of dislodged and I had to open it up to, to kind of you know, fix it and things. But opening up this old Soviet synthesizer, man, inside it's like MacGyver, you know, there's like... <laughs> Paper clips that are holding things on and tape over here and black magic happening over here. It's really, really cool. So I'm huge into synths, but I, I haven't got an old sampler yet. I'm looking for one. This gear is so expensive these days. These old, like, you know, crappy samplers that nobody really wanted back in the day are like thousands of dollars now. It's crazy. I used to have the Emu from the late 80s. It was black and, like, oh. purpley pink. I wonder which one that was. Now I can't remember. Yeah. And yeah, that was yeah. great, and I remember. I think you had four seconds, and then you bought, um, you bought like a. I think it was like this memory card that just plugged in, right? And that gave you eight right. seconds. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and you know, you'd have to like find the loop point for it to to play the same sound over and over again. Uh, I can't remember half of this stuff. It's like, it you know because it always seemed like you you traded it in because something new came along that was better. And now, of course, as you're pointing out, you know, there was stuff that was so unique through some kind of limitations. The limitations are what made it so great. And, 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 and mm. it was at the time it was like, oh, I don't, you know, when mono synths were pretty prevalent up through the early 80s. I mean, the SH-101 was the, probably one of the last official mono synths that were sold in the millions and hundreds of thousands of people bought that thing. I remember the SH-101. I, I remember working with guys who had two SH-101s. And, oh, I remember, um, what was that track? Um, oh, uh, um, Go West. Remember the band Go West? Right, yeah. They had yeah, a, yeah. Their big hit was two SH-101s tuned slightly differently playing the bass line. Oh, you know, and I, and I was cool. reading Mix Magazine or Sound on Sound probably, and they were talking about how they, you know, they synced the two SH-101s with the CV gate. Whew, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> and just like that stuff. And, Look, we can do all of these things so much easier now. Um, it's, but I think it's like uh, uh, we've, we've been having a lot of discussion um, recently about vinyl albums. And I think the thing that's important, and you're touching it all the time, the thing, uh, the thing about it is important is not is it better audio quality, is it this, is it that. It's not that. It's about what you do. It's about the experience. It's about like, because the experience brings out a level of excitement that makes you think more creatively, more creatively. Right. And the thing about vinyl is when you buy a vinyl record, it's this big, it's 12 inches square, it's got artwork. You open it up, if, hopefully it's a gatefold, <laughs> you see more of it, you see lyrics, you see credits. And credit, <laughs> credits that you can, you can read. <laughs> and you put on the album, I said this to somebody the other day, in fact I put it up on a blog, um, Dark Side of the Moon. Do you think Dark Side of the Moon is a gooder record without that Storm Thorgerson cover? Right, yeah, good point, good I point. I mean, like, you know, not that I'm saying that people did drugs anywhere near that album cover. <laughs> I'm not, not alluding to any of that, but it's just a whole right, experience. Right. When I was a kid, yeah. you know, just seeing that album cover, like, wow. Like, you know, it's whether you're articulating it or not, it's part of it. It's like... Yeah. You, I went into a record store and I'd heard about it when I was a little kid. I didn't have an MP3 of it. I didn't have a cassette of it. And I picked up the album cover and I was like, I have to buy this. Wow. I knew yeah. that everybody's... It's a monolith almost, right? So, 
It's a monolith yeah, almost. Exactly. It's a thing. It's like watching mm. 2001. You know, it's like, it's just, you know, remember that scene, you know, with the, um, when that, yeah, <laughs> the apes. Yeah, the apes yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what it means. I know. <laughs> it's just like, wow. Right. Exactly. It struck all. You know, what's interesting about that, like coming back to the whole video games thing, is that, you know, we work on these video games for, I don't know, some games can be in, in development for a long time, can be 10 years, right? But most of the time is about three to four years. Really? And um, they hype these games up. There's a lot of marketing and things. There's a lot of work that goes involved. There's millions and millions of dollars that are poured into the game from all sorts of different areas. The game comes out, it's printed on little discs, or even though that is disappearing now too. And often it sits on a shelf for three weeks and then disappears, goes out of print, and then that's it. It's gone. And a lot of the times the music that we work really hard to do, it exists solely in that 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 plastic thing, right? Once that's gone, once it's out of print, that's it. It's gone. It's disappeared. And it's kind of weird that like so much of this stuff that's digital now, right? I mean, call me like crazy. And I don't want to sound, you know, all sort of like apocalyptic or anything, but so much of the information that we transfer these days is purely digital. And if we lose that, it is gone forever. I have sessions that sit on that computer and on another computer and on a backup somewhere in some cloud somewhere. But if each one of them went, it's gone. It does not exist anywhere. Those plugins that I used on a session 10 years ago aren't around anymore. When I try to open up the session, it doesn't work anymore. So there's all those sort of things as well, right? It's weird. Yeah, it's weird. I, yeah, there's, some, there's something about the vinyl experience that I enjoy, but I'm not an idiot. I'm not an audiophile. Right. I'm not going to say vinyl so much better. It's not. It's the experience. Right. I mean, totally, are, totally, are you, totally. did you, are you, were you old enough to just still buy vinyl or was it only CD? No, so my, my introduction was cassette oh, tapes. Oh, cassettes. You're, right, right, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah, cassettes. <laughs> I never got into cassettes. I was I was vinyl, vinyl CDs. Right. I, I know there was that sort of period, late 80s, early 90s, where cassettes were like, they weren't as big in England. They never quite as sold. Really? Interesting. Yeah, very Interesting. American. When I came over here. You know, my, my introduction to music, my first introduction to music was we had – uh, like potato chips, potato crisps packets yep. here when I was like four years old or something, right? Five years old maybe. And there was a competition where if you collected enough of these packets and you sent it in, right, you could win this prize of like a box of hip hop cassettes, right? And so I, I collected all these things and just because it was a prize, I had no interest in music, but I sent these chip packets off and I won. It was like the last thing I've ever won. It was like a great moment in my life, right? It was a turning point or whatever. <laughs> and, um, this box of cassettes arrived and there was like Young MC, MC Hammer, LL Cool J, uh, all these great, great sort of hip hop stuff from the time, right? Which I got so into as a kid and that was my introduction to music. That's so amazing. cassettes have a nostalgic thing to me, I guess. That's amazing. That's, that's actually, uh, that's, that, that's a good, <laughs> I'm glad we spoke for this long to get to that point. I don't, <laughs> so you won, at four or five years old, you won tons of cassette plates, cassette tapes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And I learned two lessons there. The first lesson was that, you know, if you eat enough chips and stuff, good stuff happens. <laughs> the second lesson I learned there was that in the Australian summer, which is, you know, 45 degrees, so it's like Fahrenheit, it's 110, 115, whatever, really, 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 really quite December. hot. If you leave a cassette tape on the dash of your father's car, it goes all warped and weird and you can't play it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the plastic completely melted. It was crazy. I'm going to, we're going to wrap up. Uh, not the, I want to wrap up because I think we can talk for another 17 hours. <laughs> You're busy now, Warren. 17 hours, but I think we're going to, this is going to be a two hour one. This is pretty, pretty spectacular. Awesome. I, I hope we can do this more often. Mm, mm. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for reaching out and having a chat. This is really great. I, I absolutely love the show. I love everything you do. So it's a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. You're a great interviewer as well. It's so casual speaking with you. I don't feel uh, pride or any of that sort of stuff. It's thank all, you. Uh, you know, like information being pried out or anything. It's just purely natural with you. So thank you thank so you. very I'm much. Just, I, I'm just like, everybody I interview, I think we, we just, we're all the same. We, we didn't do music because, you know, you know, we got older and we saw girls and Ferraris, maybe, but there's no reason. When I got into music, I was still just a little kid and I just loved it and I'm passionate about it. And mm. I just, I'm blessed to be able to make any kind of living in this crazy mm. music business. Um, you know, Dave Jordan says, you know, when you, uh, when, when you get into music, you're joining the circus. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. That's so true. <laughs> We're all just circus performers. We're all just like, that's following right. around on these uh, these trailers driving through life, 
and uh, yeah. it's really blessed. Look, I'm sitting in this 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 room here is the guitar player for Taylor Swift's room. Oh, that's yeah. cool! Just Check it out. A, it's awesome. Jump a pick. See that pick? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> If Taylor Swift picks, that's yeah, awesome. Pick. I'll, I'll ask him if I can steal that this. That's fabulous. That's but, really cool. You know, so look, how many times in life do you get to sit in a Taylor Swift's guitar player's uh, uh, studio, you know? <laughs> to Taylor Swift I know. How many times in life do you have to get up at 4.30 a.m. to have a chat with Warren Hewitt? Is that Hewitt? what time it's it is? <laughs> no, it's a lot later now. No, uh, no, no. It's Australia. It's a time difference. I'm always working weird hours. So thank you ever cool. so much. You rock, mate. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Warren. I really, really I appreciate it. I want to do this more often. So much. This will be good. Yeah, it's yeah this is really, really good. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to do a little, um, uh, you know, gear thing with you if you're down for it. Yeah, totally. You might have Absolutely. to get a little bit more uh, strategic about you holding something and filming something. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to yeah, be a pain. Sure. But I'm, no, I'm for sure, sure guys, yeah, guys totally and girls would love to know just basic equipment that you've got. And I love that you use FL Studio and stuff because I get asked about that a lot. And I, I, mm. I, there's there's a there's one guy I think his name is he follows me he's called Blood Lord and I believe he's an FL Studio thing so I'm going to give him a shout out because he's a guy that nice. asked me about it and oh that's and cool I, yeah and he's he's a very there's 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 a handful of people as you know that are just really passionate and follow you and ask great questions so give him a little shout out because I know he's an FL Studio user oh well, that's awesome so thank that's you ever so much mate. Warren, thank you so much. Have a, are you back in LA? I think, aren't you? You're I'm in, in LA? Nashville at the moment. I'm heading back. To You're in Nashville, so you don't have to travel anywhere. No, oh, that's no, great. I, have no, a safe I live trip in LA, but I'm in Nashville now. Right, right. right. Well, have a safe trip back thank to LA. Thank you ever so much, mate. <laughs> Thanks, Warren. Cheers, mate. Thank See you, you later, huh? Bye.